I think the first person we've got up is uh, Sarah Benoit. Yes. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure you're queued up, ready to go once we get ready. Yes, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Are we live? No, we're not. Uh, yes, sir. I believe you're live at uh, 1 30. Okay. We'll call this afternoon session the BCC of Seminole County in order. It is July 28th, 2020, 1 30 p.m. This is the public hearing portion of the Board of County Commission meeting. We have some rules for virtual public hearings. First, I need action to accept proof of publication. So moved. Second, Delari. Moved and second. A roll call. Delari? Aye. Lockhart? Aye. Carey? Aye. Constantine? Yes. Ben Bauer, yes. Our staff will present each item for consideration with staff recommendations. The board will have an opportunity to ask questions of staff when presentation has finished. The applicant will have an opportunity to make an audio presentation. We'll then have a chance to ask questions of the presenter has finished. People interested in speaking either for or against the project should register at the Seminole County website by going to the Board of County Commissioners page and clicking on the webinar registration link. If you're unable to join via computer or online, interested parties should call 407-665. And we don't have the rest of the number. 0808. 0808-476650808 for additional information. If you'd like to make a comment and are attending the meeting via computer or iPad, click on the raise hand feature. If you've called in on telephone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. You'll be called in the order you've raised your hand. You'll only be given a you'll only allow to give public comment once per item. Speakers should state their name and address clearly for the record, who whether you're for or against the item. Speakers will be given three minutes unless you're an official spokesman of an HOA or a legally organized, recognized representative of a legal entity. Then you'll be given six minutes. If the board has any questions regarding the speaker's comments, an opportunity will be given once the speaker's time has expired. Speakers should limit their comments to pertinent information regarding the agenda item under discussion keeping your comments brief. Once all speakers are heard, the applicant will have an opportunity for rebuttal if necessary. We will then close the public hearing and put the matter in the hands of the commission for discussion, recommendation, or motion. Following a motion and a second, there will be board discussion, a vote will be taken, and a roll call vote for the purposes of the virtual meeting will be called. With that said, we're gonna start with item number 68. This is the 2020 non avalorum assessment roll. This will be presented by Sarah Benoit. Ms. Benoit. Good afternoon, commissioners. The purpose of this public hearing is to provide opportunity for public input prior to the board adopting and certifying the consolidated non abalorian assessment role for tax year 2020. The assessment role is a listing by parcel identification number of the assessment levy to fund public services that offers a special benefit to the properties on a locating basis. The public services funded in the Seminole County by non abelorian assessment provide street lighting, residential solar waste management, aquatic weed control, as well as certain capital funded projects such as road paving, middle water service lines, and reconstruction of deteriorated neighborhood walls. Typically, these services are provided in response to property owners' requests. Given the localized benefit of these public services, assessment districts uh, refers to as MSB, uh, MSBU, Municipal Service Benefit Units, are created to fund the services. When an MSBU is created, assessments are levied against a specially benefit property. The assessments are assigned on an equal unit of measurement for, um, sorry, such as per parcel or per dwelling. The 2020 non-abalorian assessment role 
which consolidates the annual variable rate assessment and the capital assessment installment billing assessed with an active MSBU. It's provided in your for your review and approval. The MSBU for which the 2020 assessment are levied were established previously by ordinance adopted at previous public hearings. The 2020 assessment rates for MSBU with bearable rates were authorized by the board via resolution 2020 R54 and on April 28, 2020. As required by Florida statute, both published and mailing notices of this hearing were issued. The assessment role presented today reflects the mail NAVA notice data. The final role submitted to the tax collector will be done on September 15 for inclusion of the 2020 property tax roll, which will include minor updates to accommodate property records changes initiated by the property appraisers office. And there will be on the solid waste um, service level changes request that we receive. The assessment role will include an assessment rate increase for street water uh, street lighting MSVU to accommodate the community support early equipment transition to LED fixtures and non fiberglass poles. Following public input, the request for action is to adopt and provide certification for the 2020 consolidated non abalone assessment role. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Benoit. Any questions for staff? Seeing none. Clint, do we have anybody from the public that desires to speak on this matter? No, sir. Okay. Seeing none, I will go to board for action. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Constein. I move approval of the two of the 2029 ad valorem assessment role. Second, Lockhart. Motion by Constein, second by Lockhart. Any further discussion? I will call the vote. Delari. Aye. Lockhart. Aye. Carey. Aye. Constantine. Yes. Zembauer, yes. Thank you, Ms. Benoit. Okay, next item on the agenda is number 69. This will be presented by Melanie Long. This is the Seminole County East Urban Bear Management Ordinance. Ms. Long, you're ready to go. Bear screen. Hold on one second, please. Where are you? I can't see it. Here it is. Okay. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, my name is Melanie Lung with the county manager's office. Item 69 considers adoption of an ordinance amending Seminole County Code Chapter 258 entitled Seminole County Urban Bear Management establishing a new section 258.13, the East Seminole County Bear Management Area located east of the big Econ Lockhatchee River within the city of Oviedo. At the June 8th PCC meeting, staff requested a continuance of the public hearing to today's meeting due to some changes requested by the city of Oviedo. Um, on June 4th, staff had received a letter from Brian Cobb, city, uh, Oviedo city manager, requesting that we reduce the area of the East Bear Management Area to east of the Big Econ Lockhatchee River. Oviedo City Council held a work session on June 1st. They worked with residents and are proposing this reduction in area. The city also requested an effective date of October 1st, 2020, which is in al alignment with their new hauler contracts. These two changes have been made to the proposed ordinance. Um, as you may know, bear calls have increased in that area. And so this is what has um, requested this ordinance. We've worked with FWC and, cont and who continues to monitor the bear calls in that area. 
And as you heard from Mike Orlando on July 14th, they are also in agreement with this new ordinance. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Long. Any uh, inquiries to staff by the commission? Commissioner Carey? So did the city of Oviedo allocate any money in their budget to assist with funding of the CANs and the requirements for this ordinance? Because as I stated before, my concern about us expanding this program is that we haven't even finished um, being able to filled all the requests that we have from the current bear management area. Um, and I certainly don't want to see us start. Uh, well, number one, we would be competing then if they're applying for FWC grants and we're still applying for grants, we're going to be competing with somebody in our own county to, you know, for funds to finish up the initial surge. And we passed our bear ordinance, what, four or five years ago? 20, in 2015. Yes, five years ago, and we still haven't been able to fulfill all the requests that we have in the current area. Well, I am not sure about their funding. However, you know, you don't have to have a bear can to be compliant with this ordinance. You just simply have to put your trash out at the appropriate times and comply with the rest of the regulations in it. Right. And so the city of Oviedo it has the manpower to enforce this. They'll enforce it through code enforcement or however they're going to do it. I just want to make sure that we're not, you know, causing our own resources to be diminished by expanding the bear management area. Well, they will be responsible for enforcement. Okay. And I'd like to know the answer, if you could find out the answer even after the fact about the funding, if they have funding to assist people. I will do that. Any, Mr. Lockhart? Well, I just want to highlight um, what Ms. Long just shared. Um, I know the, the bear trash cans, bear resistant trash cans tend to get a lot of focus on this topic, but um, certainly all of the other personal responsibility type behaviors that come along with this ordinance are, are just as, if not more important than the bear resistant trash can. So I'd hate to see us focus so much on the government subsidy of someone's trash can that we forget all of the other good things that are in the ordinance. I'll follow up okay. on the, the funding though. Okay. Any additional questions for Ms. Long? Okay, um, Clint, do we have anybody on the line from the public that wishes to speak on this matter? No, sir, no raised hands. Okay, with that, I will move to look to the board for board direction. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Lai. Make a motion to approve the ordinance amending Seminole County Code for Urban Bear Management, establishing a new section 258.13. East Seminole County Urban Bear Management in the location within the city of Oviedo limits east of the Big Econ Hachi River. Second. Second by Constantine. Any further discussion? I would like to make sure that uh, that we do coordinate with uh, the city of uh, Oviedo, if, if we're going to be asking for any uh, kind of grant money from FWC, that we coordinate those efforts uh, so we're not duplicating them, number one, nor competing against each other. Um, right. I would certainly ask that, uh, you know, we, we emphasize that with city management over there in Oviedo. We can't, and, and if, if I could just remind the board that the existing bear management ordinance does have portions of three other cities in it, Longwood, um, Altamont, and Sanford. So we're already, we, we already incorporate portions of other cities in, in the existing bear management ordinance. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any, any further discussion before I call the vote? Seeing none, Delari? Aye. Lockhart? Aye. Carey? Aye. Constantine? Yes. Zembauer? Yes. Okay, our next item is number 70, Pine Hollow Point, 
small scale future land use amendment and PD rezone. Mr. Matt Davidson from staff will be presenting this. The applicant, Dave Schmidt, is also on the line. Clint, can you verify that Mr. <laughs> Schmidt is going to be on the line? Good afternoon, Matt Davidson with the Planning Development Division. Um, item number 70 is the Pine Hollow Point Small Scale Future Land Use Amendment and PD Rezone. Uh, the applicant is requesting a small scale future land use map amendment for medium density residential to plan development in a rezone from A1 Agriculture to PD plan development in order to develop the subject property for office warehouse use with a maximum floor area ratio of 0.35. Uh, the subject property consists of three separate parcels on a total of approximately 9.94 acres. There were previously three non-conforming manufactured homes located on parcels 26G and 26H. The applicant purchased these properties in June of 2019 and has since removed the dilapidated structures. Pine Hollow Point is a private road located on parcel 26. The applicant owns parcel 26 and is proposing to utilize the existing delineated parking spaces within the private road for a portion of the required parking spaces for the future office warehouse development. A sidewalk connection and accessible route from the on-street parking to the building will be required. Existing development along Pine Hollow Point includes a facility for storage of wholesaling of fire protection equipment, an office building with warehouse storage, and a church. There are a significant amount of wetlands on, and floodplain on the subject property, property, which will limit the potential building size. Staff finds proposed plan development future land use designation and zoning classification to be consistent with the comprehensive plan and compatible with trend of development in the area. Staff recommends the Board of County Commissioners adopt the proposed ordinance enacting a small scale future land use map amendment from medium density residential to plan development and adopt the ordinance enacting a rezone from A1 agriculture to PD plan development and approve the associated development order and master development plan for approximately 9.94 acres located on the east side of Pine Hollow Point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. And do we have any questions for Mr. Davidson? And if staff could be so kind to relinquish the screen for me, it'd be great. Thank you. Uh, do we have the applicant present? I do not see a uh, Dave Schmidt um, okay. listed anywhere unless unless he's called in. Uh, I have somebody named Bruce Taylor that's raised their hand. I don't know if that's the right name. Yeah, that's from Mr. His office. Dave, Mr. Davison, is that an appropriate person to represent the applicant? Yes, sir. Okay, let's bring him in, Clint. Mr. Taylor, welcome. Hello. Yes, Mr. Taylor, you're live. You're before the Board of County Commission. Is there something you want to say or present on behalf of the applicant? I just wanted to um, appreciate the time that we have to uh, present this to the commissioners. And um, I'm here to answer any questions specifically for this project. Okay, stand by. Any questions from the commission for Mr. Taylor? Seeing none, if Mr. Taylor, if you would just uh, hang in there for us, we're going to go to public comment. Clint, do we have anybody on the phone queue here to speak in favor of this project? Uh, no, sir, I see uh, no, no speakers on the item. Nobody to speak in favor or opposition? Uh, no, sir. Okay. All right, seeing none, we will move to the board for direction and action. This is uh, Commissioner Constantine's district. Commissioner Constantine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will move to adopt the proposed ordinance enacting a small scale future land use map amendment from medium density residential to plan development and adopt the ordinance enacting a rezone from A1 agriculture to PD plan development and uh, approve the associated development order and master development plan for approximately 9.94 acres located on the east side of the Pine, Pine Hollow Point. Second. We have a motion, a second by Commissioner DeLauri. Any further discussion? <clears throat> 
Seeing none, I will call the vote. Delari? Aye. Lockhart? Aye. Carey? Aye. Constantine? Yes. Zimbauer, yes. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, next we will move to item number 71. This is uh, gonna be presented by Angie Kilhoffer, the applicant for the original special exemption request, Trey Vick will be present with the appellant who is making the appeal. Linda Lay is representing the Mount Clare Community Association. This is the Board of Adjustment Appeal, item number 71. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Constantine. Uh, thank you. Before we go into that, I do believe that uh, the county manager has a request by the applicant and approval and in, with agreement of the uh, uh, of the developer that they wish to work together and postpone this until the next meeting of August 25th. Okay, I did get a I did get a memo on that. Is um, is the applicant here? Is Miss Miss um, Lay on the line, Clint? Yes, sir. Is Mr. Vic on the line? Yes, sir. Okay, let's bring in Miss Lay, please. The applicant. Good afternoon, Miss Lay. You're on. If you'll unmute her, Clint. Good afternoon, Ms. Lay. Are you requesting a continuance on this item? Ms. Lay? Ms. Lay? Okay, Clint, let's put Ms. Lay back in the queue. Let's, um, let's bring in Mr. Vic. Okay, Mr. Vic, um, are you with us? Yes, sir. We'll try to get Mrs. Lay back in. I just want to verify um, for the understanding of the public and the board. You're okay with a continuance? Yes, it's my understanding that um, they had reached out to visit and uh, discuss the project in person, which i tried to do in the past and I'm willing to do. So yes, I, I'm okay with the understanding that we'll sit down between now and, and then be back on the agenda for the 25th meeting of August. Okay, if you would just hold in there, let's see if we can get Miss Lay back up. Please stay there with us. Miss Lay, are you with us? Miss Linda Lay. Mr. Chairman, I do believe that the county manager has a uh, uh, email that would verify that uh, if we could go to that, if we can't get a hold of Ms. Lay. Okay. I, I did receive I did receive an email from a representative from the homeowners association and Ms. Lay was, um, was copied on that. I forwarded it to your offices. We received it during the break. I, I think Angie was gonna present that to you, but um, as part of her presentation, um, so um, as you are aware, um, we do have a policy on continuances. Typically, um, under the policy, they need to be received by 12 p.m. the day before. Um, this board, though, has in the past waived that. I submit that to you for your consideration. Um, we do, um, Mr. Vick has indicated his, his um, concurrence with the request. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure why we can't hear Ms. Lay, but um, I did receive the the note that i sent to all of your offices and i think she was i believe she was copied on it um but we yeah. haven't had any I, I don't i don't know that angie's had any other discussions with them in that respect okay. haven't okay all right so uh commissioner constantine it sounds yes. like mr Vick um apparently has had some conversation so let's uh thank you mr chairman I think it's always desirable if uh, the citizens and the applicant wish to sit down and work out 
their potential differences. This has been contentious in, in my district. Actually, the Board of Adjustments was a 3-2 vote in talking to both the homeowners associations and uh, Mr. Vick. I think they both were uh, very pleased that the other side was, was willing to sit down and try to work out their concerns before it was brought to the commission chamber. Uh, I know that it's, this just happened in the recent, but um, again, it, if both sides are in agreement and they wanna sit down and they wanna try to work out their problems, who are we to uh, try to get in the way? So I think that, that uh, with that, I will move that we uh, postpone this uh, particular uh, uh, item until the next meeting, which is August 25th, uh, 2020. Second, so, I just want to make sure you're asking for a continuance, Commissioner Constantine? Yeah, continuance, if that's the proper language, yes. To a date certain? Uh, August 25th, the next meeting. Okay. Commissioner Gerard, Lari, or? We agree. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion? I would, I would not be opposed to continuing to August 25th, but I think anything beyond that would be um, unfair to the community and to, um, to Mr. Vic. So um, as long as this isn't going to become a kick the can down the road item, I think I'm, I'm okay with supporting that. I, I, I would concur with Commissioner Lockhart. Uh, I, I know that this uh, Mr. Vic has reached out uh as of as late as yesterday to ask them to attend a zoom meeting uh to voice their concerns and have dialogue not sure what ends up happening there but um my understanding mr vic and it's my understanding from both sides that there has been some reach out some conversation but they really just haven't sat down at the table so i would concur with that uh commissioner Kerry. Well, and and in my conversation with Mr. Vic, because he sent a lot of other backup information and, and, you know, so I was just trying to make sure I had all the facts together. I'm not opposed to the continuance, but again, I think he's reached out several times to the group and they just didn't want to have a conversation. And now here we are the day of the hearing and now all of a sudden they want to have a conversation. So I'm fine if he's willing to, um, to, you know, agree to the extension, but I agree with Mr. Lockhart. You know, we don't have any requirement in our code that requires there to be community meetings. And it's nice when you can have them and it's nice when everybody can agree, but sometimes it's up to the commission to make the final decision. So as long as it doesn't get delayed past the next meeting, I think that that will be okay. Since Mr. Vick has agreed with that. Understood. Okay, well then I will, uh, I will call the vote. Commissioner Villari. Aye. Mr. Lockhart. Aye. Mr. Carey. Mr. Carey. Aye. Aye. Mr. Constantine. Yes. Zembauer. Yes. Well, thank you all for uh, showing up to be ready to present your case. We appreciate it very much. All right, next we'll move to item number 72. This is the amendment to chapter 120, Junk and Junk Dealers of Seminole County Code. Jeff Hopper will present this item. Good afternoon, sir, and welcome. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, Jeff Hopper of Development Services presenting item uh, 72, a proposed amendment to chapter 120 of the Seminole County Code to revise the existing regulations pertaining to junk vehicles. The intent of the amendment is to facilitate removal of junk vehicles from public property while clarifying that these such vehicles on private property are to be addressed under existing regulations in chapter 95. When a non-operating vehicle is left on county property, such as parks, streets, or utility sites, Seminole County Code Enforcement officers must initiate a process for removing it. This process includes tagging with a notice to remove, attempting to locate and inform the owner of the violation, and having the vehicle removed at the owner's expense. The proposed code amendment creates an appeal process to allow the vehicle owner to request a hearing before the special magistrate prior to the time the vehicle is removed. This hearing allows the owner to present a case the vehicle is not a public nuisance or otherwise show why it should not be removed. 
staff recommends approval of the proposed amendments to chapter 120 of the Seminole County Code to revise regulations regarding junk vehicles. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Yep. We still have everybody. I heard a dial tone there. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Kerry, you're muted. I see you talking. Yeah, no, I said somebody making a phone call. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, no questions for staff at this juncture. Okay, Clint, do we have anybody online from the public that wishes to speak about this item? Uh, no raised hands, Commissioner. Okay. Um, I have no question. I, I guess we'll move to board action. I, I do have some inquiries. I, I maybe before we get there, let me let me inquire to a county attorney, um, Mr. Applegate. Have you had an opportunity to read through this? Uh, yes. In fact, my office prepared it, and I had uh, uh, Melissa in my office prepare the memo that you all should have received uh, outlining the ordinance. So, explain for to me and for the benefit of the public. There is a, there is some definition of junk, but how is the verification of junk arrived at? Well, uh, I'm tempted to quote the Supreme Court justice in another case, but I will not. <laughs> um, it's really is the definition, and it's up to the code inspector to make that determination and. That's what the appeal process is for. If if there's a disagreement, I wish I could be more, you know, it's in the eye to beholder. Well, and, and the reason I ask that question, in all honesty, is, and, and I'm not, I don't want to stereotype anybody in my particular district, but I will tell you that there are a lot of folks um, that have modified vehicles. Uh, maybe lifted vehicles, off-road vehicles that some may look at and say, that's junk. When in fact, that individual might have thousands of dollars invested uh, of what they have invested and believe is not junk. Um, so where does that put us in, in a scenario where we have somebody decides it is junk? I, I guess it just becomes a, well, that's what the code enforcement board and the special magistrate are for. Uh, you know, if a vehicle is operable and licensed and tagged um, currently, you know, has a current registration, that would go a long way to say it's not junk. But obviously, if it's in the yard up on blocks and got duct tape all over it, that's a different story. So, so should this have? A provision for properly licensed and registered um, tagged vehicles in the ordinance? That it, it could, um, but again, uh, depending on the condition of the vehicle, that's something else too. So, yeah, yeah again, that's what the appeal process is for. And, uh, you know, we had a very famous case, as I'm sure all you're aware of, over the years about what junk is and what junk isn't. And, and right. um, you know, there's always a risk that people are gonna disagree with it. Right. Well, the reason I ask is because I've had a great deal of interaction with some of our code enforcement officers um, since arriving here. And there seems to be some deference of what the threshold is. I've had some code enforcement tell me well, if it's not tagged and licensed, then it's considered abandoned. I've had others tell me that if it's sitting in a, a side yard or even the front yard, um, that it doesn't have to be tagged uh, or licensed. So is this, well, is this the right time to maybe trying to give, give more accurate guidance to those individuals that have to make that decision or is it not? Well, again, uh, there's a process. First, the code inspector goes out there, on, usually on a complaint, 
Uh, they don't go looking for these things. And they will first ask the person who owns the, the property more detail. Um, I don't know, I see Rebecca just got on. I'm, I'm hoping I cite the process the way that uh, they do it. But my point is, we could debate this all day. If, if you wanna have a provision put in at a, a licensed vehicle that's properly licensed and operable, I don't have a problem with that. That's, that's up to you all if you wanna add that. Sure, in. understood. Um, I'll go to Commissioner Kerry in just a moment. Uh, Ms. Hammock, just yes. for so we understand, this this revision, how does this compare to other municipalities or localities? I know during the code uh, enforcement review, y'all were looking at different municipalities on a lot of different things. Is this pretty similar to what others are doing or is this? It, it is similar, although I will say other jurisdictions do have the requirement for it to be licensed and tagged and our code does not. Uh, we just define abandoned vehicle as something where it's, you know, unusable for, for its primary purpose. However, you are allowed to store an abandoned vehicle on your property if it's in an enclosed permitted garage or a permitted carport. Right. So, but it is difficult sometimes um, for the code officers to make that distinction because, you know, they, you know, some people say, well, it is operable, it is, it is functioning, but normally they'll have them start it and if it's able to move, mm -hmm. but it is, it is a judgment call, but I think that's part of the reason why they wanted the appeal process added to the code. Right. And, and, and finally, uh, one more question I have before we go to Commissioner Kerry is, does this apply to boats? vessels yes it would them. yes it would apply to boats to all, all uh, motor vehicles so motor vehicles and vessels and watercraft yes okay commissioner Kerry. well You're we probably ought to clarify that because it specifically says junk vehicle so so here's you know a lot of people that deal with classic cars um are renovating them and it's not a fast process. Many times you're waiting for parts and other things and maybe it's torn apart. Uh, if it's in your backyard and people can't see it from you know, the street, is that a problem? I mean, to me, where we have complaints in my experience since I've been here has been when it's sitting out front and everybody can see it um, and if it's, I mean, so it may not be operable at that moment because you might have the motor torn apart. Right. Um, and so, but to me, if you had it covered with a proper car cover for the vehicle, um, and you're not going to pay to have a tag and all of that on a car that you're trying to restore. I mean, it's literally, if you're doing a great off-frame restoration, it could take a couple of years to get through that process. And so... I just want to be careful about what it is that we're saying, because you said, you know, it could be in a carport. Well, if it's in a carport and it's just sitting in a carport attached to my house, but it's not covered up, or we had a case here where, you know, right on Markham Woods Road, somebody had one outside their garage and they told them that if they would cover it up, that it would be okay. And they just put a blue tarp on it, you know, so that, <clears throat> that lasted for a short period of time. And then of course, again, it was operable when the whole thing started. It's probably been sitting there now 15 years. So, so I think that we need to be, really think of all the things and that many times we pass an ordinance and it has unintended consequences. And the, the way this is written, it doesn't say all motor vehicles, it says vehicle. It just says junk vehicle. And in the definitions, it even says vehicles and, um, you know, and even the definition of vehicle in here, it actually says not limited to automobiles, trucks, motorcycles, and tractors. So, I mean, motor Powered vehicles, by something other than humans. Right. So <laughs> motor vehicles is a very specific state statute designation. So I think that this could have a little more work done to it before we create more confusion. And I, for one, would like to see you go back and, and, maybe even talk to people who actually, you know, restore stuff or convert stuff for swamp buggies or, you know, different, different kind of things. So um, we have a lot of 
diversity in our community. And I think that, I think that, I don't think this would clarify it in my opinion for code enforcement. Um, I think that if anything, it might make it a little more confusing. I would concur with exactly what Commissioner Kerry has said. Um, so I, that, that was my questions, but we'll come back to that. Any other questions before I go to the public? Okay, okay stay, stand by. Uh, Clint, do we have anybody on the public that wishes to speak on this fact matter? Uh, no, sir, no raised hands. Okay, then I will look for action from the board. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would move that we send this back to staff and um, and have them work on it a little more to take into consideration some of the issues that were brought up here today. Uh, also, some of the definitions and um, and as I said, you know, proper covering of cars and things like that. Um, and you can buy a official car cover for any vehicle made. And uh, and so, you know. Um, Second to Larry. Yeah. Good. A motion by Commissioner Kerry, second by Delari. Discussion. Uh, I, I would concur. There are so many. I mean, I, I don't want to impede a, upon some guy or gal's, you know, desire to restore a boat or restore their father or mother's, mother's car. car. Um, um, but at the same time. I don't want people piling up cars in their front yard saying they're restoring a bunch of cars. Um, so I think we do have to do a lot of work. We really need to look at that close, maybe look at some other jurisdictions. Um, uh, Commissioner Carey has a lot of good ideas. I know she's in that industry as well as I am, that we maybe we can help staff guide you in the right direction on so many different things that you may be up against. Um, so I would support that motion. Absolutely. Mr. Lockhart and then Carrie. Um, I just have a clarification on the appeal process. It references that um, the person may appeal in accordance with section 53 of the Seminole County Code. Does that reference specifically the code enforcement board or a magistrate? Is that what 53 references? Magistrate would be for vehicles that were abandoned on uh, junk vehicles on public property. The uh, private uh, would uh, apply to code enforcement. Okay, I just want to more flexible. Fifty-three is not code. I just want to make sure that we're clear about who the person is appealing to. Are they? Because it doesn't say specifically. It says they may appeal, but is it to the code board? Is it to the board of county commissioners? Is it to the county manager? <laughs> it's to the special magistrate. Okay. Yeah. So if 53 doesn't reference that, can we put something in there that would make it clear that that's who it's being appealed to? Yeah, what I would recommend at this point is that we sit down or have staff sit down with each of you to have what concerns you have about what should and shouldn't be in the ordinance and then go back to the drawing board. I mean, I don't know a thing about restoring cars. <laughs> or what that may entail or how that may complicate someone's life. So I will not even enter into that conversation. The only thing I am concerned about is that the whoever this um, uh, is gonna be having this appeal to them, that it's clear, that's my only issue. So when staff brings it back, um, if we could just make sure that's addressed, I'm good. Commissioner Carey. Well, two things. First of all, if there is an abandoned car um, or a car that's not operable, that's left on public property. Um, there is a specific process to go through to have it towed. And I will tell you that if the, if the property is, even if it's like, let's say I have a shopping center and somebody's car dies and they pull it in and it just happens to die right there and, and it's in my parking lot, unless my parking lot is properly uh, signed, Parked, I can't even get it towed. Okay, so so again, I think there's there's two different scenarios here, and I don't I don't necessarily think you're trying to deal with if it's on public property um, and it's abandoned. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that 
like in our homeowners association rules, we have rules that say, you know, even if it's operable, you can't park your boat or your, um, you know, motor home or whatever, where it can be seen from the road. So you either have to put it in the backyard, put it behind a fence or whatever. So if I'm an individual and I've got a fenced in backyard and I'm in my backyard restoring something and my neighbor complains about it, but you can't see it from outside my property, then, you know, then I have a problem with somebody telling them that they can't be working on their restoration. The restoration. So I just think that we need to, to really kind of write rules to deal with the problems that we have and not just leave them so broad that we have unintended consequences or, or we create our own other problems <laughs> right. Right. i think I, I think staff is staff understand i think what we're we're directing as the board at this point yes what we want to see okay well if there's no other commentary i will call the vote commissioner delari Aye. Lockhart. Ask for clarification of the motion. Yes. Can someone repeat it? To send this okay. back to staff for them to take all the comments that were made and, you know, and try to rewrite this into uh, an ordinance that takes all the comments into consideration. Okay. A continuance and, to a non-date certain. Non-date certain. Okay, thank and, you. And, and Commissioner Lockhart, I would hope that everybody that has made the comments today and those that haven't will get with staff so that they have clarification of the concerns that they have. I just wanted to, I didn't hear a date certain. That was what I wanted. Thank you. Aye. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Carrie? Aye. Constantine? Yes. Zimbauer? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Okay, next will be item number 73. This is the Seminole Avenue right away vacate. This will be put on by Dana Lee Pettick. And this is the vacate. The applicant is Julian Cotto and possibly Phil Capro. Clint, if you want to check to see if those individuals uh, are ready to come into queue as soon as staff is done with their presentation. Yes, sir. They're both they're both available. Okay. All right, Dana Lee, you're set to go. Good afternoon, Dana Lee Pettick, Planning and Development Division. This request is to vacate and abandon <clears throat> an uncut portion of the public right of way known as Seminole Avenue, as recorded in Plot Book 10, page 100, and the public records of Seminole County for pro property located on Seminole Avenue, approximately 1,000 feet north of McCulloch Road in Oviedo, Florida. The right of way is part of the Orlando Industrial Park Plat. The requested vacate is for the purpose of a future development of the property that is vacant and located to the east of the requested right of way vacate. The platted right of way is located between properties owned by two separate entities, each of whom will receive a portion of the right of way once vacated. The adjacent property owner, Hometown Palm Valley, has provided a letter of no objection to the vacate. The applicant has provided letters of no objection from all applicable utility companies as well, and Public Works has no objection to the requested vacate. Public Works has also requested a drainage easement over a portion of the vacated right-of-way, which has been provided to the county for recording following approval. This request complies with the requirements for vacating a right-of-way under the Land Development Code and the authority granted by the Florida statutes. Therefore, staff recommends the Board of County Commission commissioners adopt the resolution vacating and abandoning an uncut portion of the public right-of-way known as Seminole Avenue as requested. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions for staff? Okay, seeing none, is the applicant uh, desire to make any statements? Clint, if you can uh, inquire and bring them in if so. Good afternoon, this is Julian Cotto, and uh, I'm just here to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Cotto, if you would, for the record, state your full name and address. Julian Cotto, 303 Avila Court, Winter Springs, Florida. Okay, any questions for Mr. Cotto on behalf of the applicant? 
Okay, seeing none, hang tight with us, Mr. Cotto. Well, do we have anybody uh, from the public in the queue that wishes to speak in favor of this project? No, sir. Do we have anyone in the queue that wishes to speak in opposition to this application? No, sir. Okay, seeing none, I will move to board action. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lari. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to adopt a resolution vacating and abandon an uncut portion of the public right of way known as Seminole Avenue, as recorded in Plat Book 10, page 100, in the public records of Seminole County, Florida. Second. 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 We have a motion by Commissioner DeLauri. We have a second by Commissioner Lockhart. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I will call the vote. Commissioner DeLauri? Aye. Lockhart? Aye. Carey? Aye. Constantine? Yes. Zembauer? Yes. Thank you all very much. Mr. Chairman, before you move on and before Mr. Yes. Capro leaves the area, I don't know if you can see in the participant frame of your <clears> screen, <throat> but it is so helpful. Whatever it was that he did when signing up to speak for the meeting, it actually references who he is and what item number he's speaking about. If we can figure out how to get that to happen in the future, that would be amazing. It's incredibly helpful. Yeah, so so we've had that, and I have a printout. But experience thus far has said that they're not always they're not always there, or we can't get them on the queue and get them in. Well, it's the first time I've seen it, and it was great. So if there's a way we can figure out how to do that in the future, that'd be awesome. Gotcha. I don't I don't have whatever printout it is you have. I just get to see what's over here on the side. Right, right. Gotcha. All right. Thank thanks. you. Okay, anything else before we move on to the county manager's report? The county manager is going to provide information about the earlier topic discussed, which is the English Estate Sidewalk Project, and several public participants <coughs> will speak. So if you are on the line um, and desire to speak on this, you can. But right now, Ms. EA is going to give us information, and the board will have discussion accordingly. Ms. EA? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the English Estate Sidewalk Project is a listed project within the um, interlocal agreement for the 2014 infrastructure sales tax. I think there's about $750,000 um, listed in there for sidewalks within at various locations within English Estates. Um, we are currently in the design phase for this project, um, and as part of that phase, there's public outreach um, and Sometimes nobody has any interest in sidewalks. That is not the case um, with respect to this project. We received considerable feedback um, with respect to this project. Um, there seems to be a, a significant number of people who are concerned about the project. It's an established neighborhood. It could disrupt tree lines, et cetera. Um, we forwarded to all of your offices background information on this, including um, all of the emails that we've received. I think some of your offices have probably received emails um, directly as well. We also did um, a survey and, um, and there was a map that showed you sort of some of the responses to folks supporting or, or in support or not in support of the sidewalk project as presented. And I believe you also received a petition. Um, that map sort of helps validate the petition as well. Um, so, um, there's been discussion about should we move forward with this project um, it, and it is particularly important for the board to weigh in on whether or not we move forward with this project because it was a specifically listed project within the referendum. Um, it's on, there are a number of schedules of projects in there. This is on list C and in the interlocal agreement that we have with our other partners, um, if we want to remove an item from that list, the board has to take action. Um, you've done it by resolution in the past. when We've added items um, it, at a public meeting um, in order to make a change to the enumerated projects. Um, so uh, we wanted to talk to you today before we put that on the agenda um, because we, uh, from a staff standpoint and from a manager standpoint, I, I don't think it's a good 
practice to have one commissioner decide they want to put something on the agenda for um, for removal or addition to the sales tax list. So um, this is in Commissioner Lockhart's district and she asked that I bring this up to the board so we could have a discussion um, as well as um, respond to some of the public input, listen to some of the in public input. And you could give um, staff direction as to whether or not um, as a board you would like us to bring forward a resolution dealing with the status of, of this particular project. So, and as you indicated, Commissioner uh, Chairman, I think we have a number of people from the neighborhood who um, would like to speak on this today. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't doubt that. And I, I would, I have no problem bringing it forward on the agenda for consideration and discussion um, whatsoever. Um, I think I've received a lot of emails uh, as well as a petition. I'm assuming everybody else has as well, um, but I won't speak for those. But with that said, I also want to ex parte on everything today is prepared and ready to go. Uh, Commissioner Carey. Well, I was gonna say if, if the consensus of the board is to bring it forward as an item, because as she said, it has to be formally removed um, and we had to do that as a public hearing, I think that's the appropriate time. We've all received all the correspondence and documentation of certainly something that we could consider removing. So, um, so I don't know if you wanna hear public, I mean, usually we hear public comment when we actually have an action item for it. I mean, I don't have an issue bringing it back, but I'd like it to be brought back as a public hearing so that those who still want to give their input can. Um, I, I would concur, and I don't know that we need to take a, a lot of public input today. I think we've received that in writing, uh, and if we're going to put it on the agenda, there'll be public hearing for all those people to weigh in. I would like to maybe hear from uh, staff, at least initially, um, you say we're in the design phase. How much money is, do we have any idea how much money has been allocated to this project thus far? And, and that can all come into public hearing. I, I don't know what we, I, I, I can get you that number. I don't have that number. I will tell you, Chairman, that I think, um, that there was an expectation on the public's part to be able to tell you how they feel about this project. So you may you may want to take some of that public comment. It may make the public hearing process go more quickly. But I, I um, one of the reasons that um, that we we went ahead and wanted to discuss this and specifically listed it on the agenda because I don't normally put my report topics on the agenda is because we knew there were some some members of the public who really wanted to share with you um, their thoughts on this project. So um, there have probably been some folks waiting on the line to speak. So I just want to advise you to that, that um, the rest of the board may not be aware of that, but there probably are some folks out there on that participant list who um, who would like to share some thoughts with you. Sure, understood. Commissioner Lockhart. Yeah, I, I appreciate the county manager um, working to get this on the agenda. Um, initially, my my hope had been that we would be able to get all of the information together to bring this to put on the agenda for an action item so that it wouldn't have to be bifurcated. But um, after conversation with the county manager, she felt like it was, and I want to put words in your mouth, Nicole, so correct me, but um, that it would be more appropriate for the whole board to give her direction to bring something like this back on an agenda item. And so there was sort of a compromise with the community, if you will, that she be able to bring this up under her report so that the board could hear comment from the community so that then you could decide as a whole if you wanted it to come back as an agenda item. I don't know if that totally captures the, the process or not. But, but but my concern is, you know, Mr. Chairman, these folks have been very, very um, intent on making sure that you hear from them. I would suggest at minimum you hear from the um, the HOA president who has been, um, as we all know, the, the only thing more complicated than being a, an elected official is being an HOA president. And he, he has been fielding lots and lots of input from his community. So to at least allow him to share with us that I think would be appropriate if you're if you would consider that. I, I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. Um, 
what I don't want to do is get into two public hearings, one that we're having today that we're really not going to take action and, and, and make any decisions on and then follow up maybe next month that we're going to redo it all over again. And quite honestly, I think I, I'm pretty clear on where the people stand in English estates. Um, I've had a great deal of communication from them on both sides, but I'm happy to, I have no problem. I'm, I'll stay here till midnight for as many people that want to speak or, or weigh in. And I got no problem with that at all. Never, never want to discourage anybody's involvement or public participation whatsoever. Maybe so. we can ask Clint how many he's got in the queue on this, because again, if we're going to advertise a public hearing, I mean, we've all gotten the communication, um, written communications pro, for and against, but petitions as well. So. All right. Chairman. Um, Commissioner Delari. Thank you. Uh, after hearing Commissioner Lockhart's concerns, I actually walked that entire neighborhood uh, one weekday and one Saturday. And I would agree that there's a lot of established homes there, if not all of them are pretty established, beautiful neighborhood. And I will tell you that when I walked those neighborhoods, I saw very few automobiles or cars going through the neighborhood because they're so established, you don't really need sidewalks on those side streets. The issue that I see is that when I was looking at the uh, referendum for the one cent sales tax, when we were talking about English estates, I was under the impression that it was for sidewalks on Oxford Road. So I'd like to hear from the public when they're talking about the side, uh, sidewalks to differentiate between the sidewalks in their neighborhoods and the sidewalks on Oxford Road because Oxford Road does need some rehab and I think some things need to happen there. So I wanna make sure that we're actually differentiating those two needs. Well, and of course, as you, you're fully aware as, as the chair of Metro Plan, Complete Streets is a big push on funding from our federal partners uh, on how we get funding into our roads and sidewalks and so on and so forth. So with that said, I'm, I'm happy. Like I said, I'm happy to spend all night here and take as many calls or input. I'm fine with that. Everybody else good with that? Good. Okay, Clint, let's bring the first one in. Okay, name and address for the record, please. My name is Mark Harden. I live at 2460 Markingham Road. And uh, my uh, discussion today has to do with the county manager's report on the English estate uh, sidewalk project. I'm against this project uh, for the following reasons. First of all, the justification for this project wasn't really communicated well to property owners that would be affected. I first learned about this in a mailed publication uh, a few weeks ago <clears throat> that had incorrect webinar information to begin with. Everyone I've spoken to on Markingham Road are not in favor of this project. There are unknown property owner cost impacts due to relocation of sprinkler lands and sewer clean out ports, landscaping, retaining walls, etc. There will be an impact due to loss of driveway access where the sidewalk intersects existing driveways. The negative impact of property values from removal of trees bordering Markingham Road is unwanted, and our road is among the shadiest in the neighborhood, making it a desirable place to live. We've lived at our current address for 22 years without sidewalks and see no need for a change. Thank you for this opportunity to share my feedback. And it's my first time addressing the commission. Thank you, Mr. Harden. Any questions for Mr. Harden? Nope. Thank you, Mr. Harden. Next up we have, looks like Mr. Taylor, if you would state your name and address for the record, Mr. Taylor. Hey, good afternoon. This is Derek Taylor. Uh, my address is 2353 Sunderland Road. And Maitland okay, Hall. go ahead, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Um, no, I appreciate uh, appreciate your time uh, and y'all uh, taking the opportunity to, uh, to hear the feedback. Um, we've been in the neighborhood for three years now, uh, recently moved in um, and then immediately had a child and uh, have been going through the process of raising um, 
a young one in this neighborhood. And um, similar to uh, Commissioner Delari's uh, comments, I feel totally comfortable walking on our streets as a neighborhood. We've really grown to love. A lot of the neighbors are out on the side streets, actually convening um, every every day, every afternoon. Um, cars, when they do pass through, are usually neighbors passing to get to their house, waving at everyone, and uh, actually moving around people because it seems to be a gathering spot um, in the way this neighborhood is laid out. Uh, so it's it's a, it's a really attractive feature of a neighborhood. I think that a lot of people long for when they move in um, and with the amount of uh, established trees that's really casting a lot of shade on that obviously it makes it um, to be to be uh, convened in uh, so my biggest concern is just the loss of the trees um, I understand uh, the right of way through there um, it just be it just be detrimental I think to the community of the neighborhood um, just by removing those trees additionally <coughs> sun gets older um, I feel free letting him run to go see his friends down those side streets, uh, but similar to uh, Commissioner Lari's comment, the Oxford Road portion, which actually these three phases indicate that the new sidewalks will connect to the Oxford Road connection to the school, um, particularly between Hunterfield uh, and the north section of that. It is a paved area that is in line with the road on an S-curve. A lot of people are driving real fast down Oxford. Um, I do not feel safe sending my son to cross that street to go see his friend on the other side of the neighborhood. So I would prefer if there was the ability to try to reallocate some of those funds to improve Oxford as the sort of central spine that we're trying to send kids up to the school. I think improvements on that would probably do a lot better good uh, for our neighborhood than trying to tear up the side streets that are pretty quiet right now as it is. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you for your time. Next up, Clint, Mr. Stephen Pilling. Hi, I think I may actually be the one talking. I'm Cindy Pilling, his wife. Okay. Um, first of all, um, Amy Lockhart, I'd like to thank you for all that you're doing on behalf of us and the great um, assistance you've been as we try to walk through this um, impact to our neighborhood. Mr. Delari, I'd also like to say thank you for taking such a vested interest in this project. Uh, it blows my mind to hear that you are actually out here and mm -hmm. walking our neighborhoods to check the area out. So thank you both very much. I've lived at 21 85 Hunterfield Road for 25 years now. I raised five children on this street without any sidewalks and um, the impact to my landscaping alone, while it's negligible because I don't have any trees in that easement area, um, it will still have a big impact. And as my neighbors have already said, the mature landscaping um, and everything else it's going to impact, I think, would just be a shame to all the work and the beauty that um, has gone into that area. I think the sidewalks are unnecessary. Um, it seems funny to me that we're talking about sidewalks for safety when there are areas of complete darkness um, on these pathways that even streetlights would make them safer than sidewalks. So I walk the neighborhood at least two miles every day and I've never felt uh, at risk. So thank you for listening to me and for bringing this up again in a way that will allow us maybe to take some further action. Okay, thank you, Ms. Billing. Okay, um, it looks like I can't make it. Just Jordan. Yes. Yes, please. Your name and address for the record. L. J. Jordan, and I live at two four five eight Carrollton Road. I've lived here since two thousand and three, and I know all of my neighbors. We're a wonderful street, and thank you for walking our neighborhood, Commissioner Delari. You got to enjoy what I feel is a very homey mm -hmm. neighborhood where everybody kind of looks out for each other. The biggest thing I think that we oppose is the change of climate that sidewalks would create because it turns what is a very comfortable feeling neighborhood into what seems like an urban 
jungle atmosphere when you add five foot of concrete in everybody's front yard. Um, I don't want to be the dead horse. Obviously, I'm against the sidewalks. I totally agree that Oxford Road needs all kind of attention. Mm -hmm. And that means also probably speed bumps to slow them down because people do not go 25 and it is a school zone and I have been passed by the school by cars exceeding that speed limit. So safety issues really are a concern by the school, yes, because speeders are using Oxford as a cut through. So that's all I wanna say. Thank you so much for listening to us because this has been on all of our minds, trust me. Thank you. Mr. Sean Cable. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I am the president of the HOA, and uh, I Sean, think if you, Sean, if you'd give us your name and address for the yeah. record, please. Sean Cable, 2165 Hunter Field Road, Maitland, Florida, 32751. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm the president of the HOA. Um, I just want to say thank you, Amy. Bless you. It's been, uh, this has been a, uh, a very controversial topic in our neighborhood and um, very difficult because uh, everybody has a different opinion. I do want to say publicly, though, that the HOA is not taking a position because I have heard from just as many people for the sidewalks as I have against the sidewalks. So um, at this point, I really just have to leave it up to the community to decide um, what's best for our community. And that's the way I'm going to play it. OK, thank you, Mr. Cable. Thank you, well, I, I tell you what, with that said, um, I'm happy to let as many people come in today as y'all would like and entertain. Um, but if we're going to bring this on the agenda, uh, it sounds like we're going to have people talking on both sides of it, according to the HOA president. Commissioner Kerry. Well, Mr. Chairman, even in the few people that just spoke about it, I mean, they, it sounds to me like they're not interested in sidewalks in their neighborhood, but clearly Oxford Road probably needs sidewalks and needs some, you know, probably some safe crossings and things like that, because you do have the school right there and, and you have, you know, uh, English estates is on both sides of the road. So I do think that, you know, maybe looking at the project and, and one of the things that I'd like to see from staff as part of the item on the agenda is, you know, what exactly was in the language of the ta of the penny sales tax? Is it Oxford Road or is it specific roads in English estates? So let's see exactly what was proposed and then see maybe a, a modified plan to address Oxford Road and its issues, and then um, and then the the difference when you get into the neighborhood, you know, of uh, Fieldingwood Road and Castlewood, Poinsettia South, Huntersfield, you know, all the roads internally, and uh, many of us are very familiar with the English estates, and so I think that, you know, it's kind of like our neighborhood. We don't get a lot of traffic through here, except the people that live here. And so, cause you can't really cut through to go somewhere necessarily, but Oxford Road is a whole other story. Right, understood. So what is the flavor of the board or what direction do you want to give beyond what we've already given? Sounds like we've got, we want staff to look at Oxford, the entire project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Bring that back to us for public input agenda as to what direction we actually go. Would you like to have a community meeting with the district commissioner uh, prior to that? Once they get to study with Oxford versus what they have now and see what the flavor of the majority of those folks would like to do? And how, how do y'all want to do it? Mr. Lockhart? Well, I mean, the community has certainly been communicating um, very well. They've, they have done an excellent job um, of making sure that everyone in the area is updated between Nextdoor, their website, Facebook, and all of the other um, means of communication. I, I, don't, I don't know that an additional town hall meeting would be necessary. I'm happy to do one, but I don't know that it's necessary. Um, Oxford Road, I hear about a lot. Um, we have a couple of folks in the English Estates area who've been communicating with, with members of our engineering team somewhat regularly 
uh, pleading really with what can we do? How can we help with traffic calming? Um, one individual in particular wants to see stop signs at, at various intersections and engineering has kind of said, no, we don't want to do stop signs there. That could actually cause more of an issue. So there is currently a lot of conversation going on with our engineering team and members of the community about Oxford Road. So I'm assuming it wouldn't take too much effort to pull together some, some alternatives there. Um, I, I definitely um, appreciate the board being willing to make this an agenda item. That is ultimately, that was my ultimate goal was to be able to have this board hear the input and make a decision. I don't take this lightly, obviously taking something off of the sales tax uh, advertised, um, you know, referendum is a big deal, but to Commissioner Kerry's point, the way that it was worded and how it was listed is also very important. So if we can bring that back, that would be great. I, I have no problem if we can bring this back, even at our next board meeting, I'm not sure how much time staff needs, but I'd like it to be a date certain. Okay, Commissioner Kerry. Well, plus there is improvements coming on a section of Oxford Road right. you know, that will kind of narrow it up. And, and there's been some discussion about, you know, are there roundabouts, are there this, are there that? So I, I, I really think that Oxford Road should be a standalone project. Um, and what the needs for Oxford Road are gonna be one thing. And again, I. I I don't know that we need necessarily sidewalks in every neighborhood, but most of these projects got on the sales tax because we were trying to provide sidewalks in all the neighborhoods to connect them to the schools. And that was the primary purpose. And if you look at a lot of our sidewalk projects that we approve contracts on, they're making connections to the school because we were trying to get that done countywide. And I'm sure that's probably why English Estates was on there. But um, I'd like to just make sure it comes back as a public hearing. I think it would be helpful for everybody if the entire community understood what's already proposed for Oxford Road. And when you look at Oxford Road from 436 all the way around and then the connection over to 1792, how does that impact you know, this whole area, how far down does that improvement go? And then what section are we left talking about to get to Derbyshire? I, I think that that would be helpful for everyone. Okay, Commissioner Delari. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Oxford Road that we're planning on widening with the uh, piece when it comes to the Lowe's piece, it's a little further to the, I guess the North, uh, this part of Oxford Road is further to the south. Uh, Oxford Road, in my initial review of it, just walking it, there are sidewalk issues, there's traffic calming devices, there are issues, there's cross access issues, there's also stormwater issues. There's a whole number of, number of things that need to happen. I agree with Commissioner Carey that Oxford Road should be its own standalone project, and we shouldn't be uh, disturbing the existing neighborhoods. Uh, walking some of the streets there, if we put sidewalks in some of the streets, we're going to be disrupting people's well fields, I'm sorry, sanitary uh, leaching fields for their sanitary septic systems. So and there's, that's not even to talk about all the trees that would have to come down. There's a lot of things. I would be wanting to bring this back, but when we look at Oxford Road, look at it completely, including stormwater, as well as access, as well as sidewalks from a safety standpoint, to make sure that anyone that is on Oxford Road, there's no issues when it comes to safety. Yeah, I, I hope somebody's leech field's not in the public right away, but... Um, well, put some of the sidewalks in, uh, depending on where you put it in, a homeowner brought a tape measure out, you'd be going into the leaching field of the septic system. Well, I would hope that the septic system is not there, and I, and I hopefully it sounds like before we get this on the agenda, it sounds like we need to know whether we have right away there at all. And that might just answer the whole question. <laughs> if you don't have right away, can't put a sidewalk there. Uh, it sounds like that's what I'm hearing. Commissioner Carey. Well, and that, you know, I should have mentioned that earlier because one of our first speakers said something about there's retaining walls and all kinds of stuff that would be interrupted. And I just want to say, if we have retaining walls and septic system drain fills and clean outs and all of that in the public right away, 
we have a better, bigger problem than whether we're going to put sidewalks in or not. So, um, so I think that needs to be addressed and maybe our surveying team and our engineering team need to go out there and just see what's exactly. What I, will give, I will give them the address where that uh, drain field is. Field is. Commissioner Constantine, then Commissioner Lockhart. I was just going to say, uh, we could talk about speculation all day. I think we all have what Commissioner Lockhart has asked that we um, look at this, put it back, uh, put it on the agenda, have the staff review it, figure out whether or not we want to keep it on the uh, sales tax list. I think we've heard from some of the citizens, including Sean, who um, is uh, someone who is always looking out for his citizens over there at English Estates. And uh, I think that we can go through this all day, but I, I do believe that we've got some questions to answer. We know what we want to do. I will leave it to Commissioner Lockhart to finish it off, but um, I, I, I think we know what the answer is. Let's, let's put it on the agenda and let's talk about it then. Commissioner Lockhart. One more thing that I would ask from staff if possible is where are, and I think this may be on that dashboard that Jacobs talked to us about at our, at our last meeting, but um, the total number of sidewalk projects that we have in the queue, where they are in terms of design and where they were in terms of prioritization. There was a, there was had to have been a methodology that was used and we saw that in the Kittleson report in terms of giving it a certain number of points for how far away you were for an elementary school versus a middle school and so there was a methodology that prioritized these projects i'd like to know where this project is in that prioritization where the other projects are that we still have to complete how many are in design? How many have been in construction and completed? I just kind of want to get a feel for where are we with this whole sidewalk thing? Because if this is one of the last ones to wrap it up, or if this is one of the last ones in design, you know, maybe there are some others that would be better off moving up the list. I just kind of want to see where we are in the whole scheme of things. Okay. Is that something that staff has readily available? So, so that sounds like two different things. Uh, we, I, I think don't we think got. So. Okay, well, we go consensus. You want us on the agenda, right? For the English Estates portion. Right. And I'd and like them to bring back as a part of, along with Commissioner Kerry's request to have the language of how it was advertised in the sales tax referendum, I'd like to see the methodology of, of this particular project and where it is in the list and along with all the other projects and where they are in design and you know i just want to see where the the order and thought process is so i know if we yank this out what does that do does it bring others up are there i'm just kind of flying blind here I, i'd like some context okay commissioner Kerry. well and to that point i mean maybe before any design gets started so we have this list and we have the Kittleson report that says, you know, elementary schools, middle schools, this should be the priority and how that all happens. But this isn't the first time we've had a community who has said, we don't want sidewalks and we want you to, to not do this project. Um, maybe they weren't on the sales tax list. So we didn't have to have a public hearing to amend that portion of it. But I do think that maybe a process we should put in place or at least consider is before we actually start spending money on design, we have that community meeting and talk about here's what's proposed and here's how we're going to, you know, where the sidewalks would be. Because in a lot of these cases, you know, we're proposing like to put sidewalks on both sides of the road rather than just one side of the road. Um, and again, in a neighborhood that has very little traffic, other than the residents that live there. Do you really need that? So I think that we could probably cover more projects and maybe get some more road projects moved up the ranks by reshuffling some of the money. And that's part of what the Jacobs every year when they look at that and evaluate that they go through is the prioritization. But I'm with Commissioner Lockhart. I'd like to just see the sidewalk part because most everybody wants a road improved but they don't necessarily want you to disrupt their neighborhood for sidewalks. 
Okay, so it sounds like we want two things. We want a complete breakdown of the sidewalk inventory and where each sidewalk in this county is, either in design, et cetera, et cetera, or where it ranks. On the list. What's on the on list. list, right. Not a sidewalk, but what's on our sales tax list or our sidewalk project list. Right. We have some projects that are not sales tax paid for, but they're on the sidewalk list. So let's just correct. And, and what I've what I've encountered on some of these is we've moved sidewalk projects up and down the list based on maybe an F dot project or there was some grant money coming to a certain area in the county that oh well now's the time to do the sidewalk now versus later because we're going to be doing X right, um, right. and so. I think I'll leave that with staff on how you. I think we've, we've, we've got about 36 named sidewalk projects on the list. So it'll be easy to tell you kind of where, where they are on that. I, and I can answer your question right now, Commissioner Kerry, about English estates and how it's described in the sales tax list. It's just described as the English estate subdivision, various locations. So a lot, it, it can be more, a lot of other, a lot of other projects are more specific. So we, so we reference back to the Kittleson report from 2011, and there are very specific details about which sidewalks are recommended in there. So that's how the project came to be based on that report. But we have some flexibility. And what I'm hearing is maybe we want to change that to Oxford Road sidewalks as opposed to English estate sidewalks, but we can, we'll, we'll work a little bit on that. Um, and bring bring back something that gives certainty to both the board and the neighborhood is about as, as to what projects might might happen in that area. Um, and I think I think we can very easily give you some information on the named sidewalk projects where they are and and kind of how how and why they're prioritized the way they are with respect to the sales tax program because there aren't that many of them in the county that that we couldn't give you a list to, well, to show you where we are on that and. Again, from a policy standpoint, I, I mean, I really, we don't start new road projects without having a community meeting. Right. So I think that before we spend money to even start the design of a project, because now whatever money has been spent on design, which is one of the questions that Commissioner Lockhart asked you to bring back that number, how much have we spent to date? Um, and we wouldn't have spent anything if we would have just had that policy in place that before we start a project, we have that community you know conversation mm -hmm. so so we'll get you those numbers um we'll we'll bring you back sort of a revision to the the list also the information um about prioritizing and the status of projects um i think that we can have that back to you by the meeting on the 25th of august um my phone might blow up with from staff but I, i'll go ahead and make that commitment and for some reason we can't we've got a lot of information already a lot of feedback so um and and many thanks i congratulate the neighborhood for being so engaged and involved um it, it it's helpful in decision making um so we i i will say right now that our plan will be to bring it back to you on the 25th we will stay in in contact with the neighborhood um and let folks know keep keep them apprised of the status um i have a couple of questions for you um before before we wrap it up if, if that's all right um the first is Commissioner Carey, you you have referenced a public hearing a couple of times. What the what the interlocal requires is a public a noticed public meeting is the terminology, and there really there's a distinction there in that a public hearing has specific advertising requirements in the statute, um, newspaper advertising, etc. A public meeting we notice it on the agenda. If the neighborhood is interested, we we send the neighborhood notice. So I just want to make sure we schedule this appropriately. We my expectation is we would put it on the regular agenda as a public meeting, a noticed public meeting, um, and we would note we would make sure the neighborhood is notified about what's happening, as opposed to a public hearing that requires certain advertisements in the newspaper, et cetera. And really, when I said public hearing, I, my intent is, you know, I mean, I know the public has a right to speak at everything mm -hmm. do these days, but on a regular agenda item, you know, we don't we don't always have as much public input as we do on public hearing items. So I, you can, it could be a regular agenda item, but we have, you know, lots of people who have contacted our offices. I'm sure we all have a lot of overlap there. And I just want to make sure that everybody who has noticed 
us, including I understand you have a portal on the website where people mm -hmm. can comment. I just want to make sure that it gets back all that information to them. So whether it's a, a sure. an advertised public hearing or it's a regular meeting that's publicly noticed to the people who are interested, I want to make sure they get notified so that they have an opportunity to come and speak at that particular hearing. Understood. My, se my second question to the board is a broader question. Um, and the, the reason that I wanted to come to you before placing this on the agenda is while this almost seems like a no brainer, um, there's a lot of public input. It's not a real controversial project. There are some folks that would like to see the sidewalks, but for the most part, there seems to be a, a majority sentiment. My concern is there may be other projects on the sales tax list that are more controversial. And I, I, I wanted to establish a protocol that if a commissioner in any district is concerned about a project on the sales tax list, that, that they not go to staff directly and say, put this on the agenda, um, do a resolution to either change this project or take this project off. I, I think with every project on the sales tax list, we should have a conversation with the board first before putting anything on the agenda. Um, to either remove it or significantly modify um, a scope. So that's why um, that's why we're sort of doing it as Commissioner Lockhart mentioned a bifurcated process. But I think it's important since this was part of a referendum, and and while this board is really responsible about that, there could be changes in a few years. And who, I, I just want to make sure that we have a protocol that doesn't put staff in a bad position doesn't put the rest of the board in a bad position wherein one commissioner says I want to take off I want to take off the Oxford Road project so let's put a resolution on um, so I, I, that's why it, it, it does seem cumbersome and especially for a sidewalk project but I just want to if, if the board would prefer that we schedule them without this initial conversation we can do that too um, I, however you, you tell me how you how you'd like to be engaged in that decision to put these on the agenda well, I, I would think that uh, this is a this was put before the public as a referendum item, countywide, um, and, and we don't we can't predict the future. We can't predict who will be sitting in these chairs in the future. Uh, I think it would be wise that the this should be a collaborative board decision on these kinds of projects uh, before we just before I walk in and say, hey. Take all these out of my district. We don't want them because, you know, 50 people said they don't want it. And, and maybe the most of them don't. Uh, but I think we've got to be careful because it was a promise made, whether the language was right or not. Uh, I, I think there should be discussion amongst the board before we just arbitrarily, just as commissioners separately, to start pulling things off or put it on the agenda. Um, that would be my thought process. Commissioner Kerry? Well, and, and no one commissioner should be directing staff to do anything. So there is already a protocol in, in place for that. And even the chairman should not be directing staff to put something on or take something off. It, I think that the way that Ms. Guillet handled it to bring it up under her report, and even though it's a more cumbersome process um, to get you know, buy-in from the entire board that this, that they would want to hear this doesn't mean we're going to change our mind. It means that we're going to hear it and we're going to hear from the public on both sides, just like we would do any other public input uh, as at a hearing. So, um, so I think that it was handled correctly. And quite honestly, if, if any one commissioner is trying to control what's happening uh, on the agenda or with projects, I would expect that the county manager would immediately notify the entire board of that going on because that's kind of a violation of our charter. And, and can, can I say for the record, I don't want to give the impression that Commissioner Lockhart came to me and tried to get me to put a resolution on the board. That's not, we, we, she, she raised the issue. It's in her district. So I just want to make that perfectly clear that I, I don't want to give the implication that that's what happened here, but and I know I for, maybe for, did. I mean, she did the right thing. You're the county manager. If we have an issue, our responsibility is to go to the county manager and, and your responsibility is to direct staff to get the information and get it back. So I think Commissioner Lockhart did exactly the right thing. And I think that you did the right thing by bringing it up under your report and getting input from the rest of the board. And now you know what to do. But the motion was not date specific. So if right. it's a you know, we still got staff working, you know, not everybody's back at work. We still have people working remotely. So if it doesn't get back in August, then 
that's okay. I just I wanted to come back timely. Um, but I think that the process that you and Commissioner Lockhart followed were exactly what should have happened. Okay, so clear it's going to be on the future agenda. Staff's going to work on that and also keep the community engaged and involved during the process to let the community know when it's going to be on the agenda. And it sounds like you've committed to get it on the 28th. The 25th, we're, I, I, we're going to shoot for that. Okay. All right. Anything I, else, Commissioner Lockhart? Well, you know, Nicole asked for feedback on, you know, how to get items on the agenda. And, you know, I just think that we need to have something in writing about how what the expectation is when an individual board member wants to put something on on the agenda not that an individual board member wants to necessarily you know be the man behind the curtain at all but but there there needs to be a process that's in writing so that administratively oh, so I will address that. commissioner lockhart you and i have already asked for that very early in our tenure as commissioners. Um, and I was gonna bring that up under my district or chairman's report, uh, those policies and procedure for the board, which address exactly that. Um, I, I don't wanna go into it deep now and replicate it during my report, okay. but I hear you loud and clear. Well, I, I just wanna make sure that she, I, I mean, I, I think it's a completely reasonable request that she made as a part of this discussion. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So we're clear on what's going to happen on the English state sidewalk projects, correct? Yes, sir. All right. You want to just give us a, a recap so that everybody's clear, including the community? Sure. So we're, we're going to go back um, and, and based on the feedback that we received from the board and from the community, we will bring you a proposed revision to the sales tax project list. Uh, we will also um, bring you information on the status of all of the pro all of the sidewalk projects on that list um, and sort of priority and, and order and status of um, the work that's being done on them. We'll get you some information on what's been expended on this project so far. Um, and I think that is it. We're, and we're going to shoot for the 25th. We will keep the, it, uh, we'll do it as a regular agenda item. We'll have it noticed on the agenda, but we'll also notice all of the people who have been engaged in the discussion thus far from the neighborhood. And, and we'll certainly work with Mr. Cable to, to get the information out to the Homeowners Association for any folks that are interested but haven't actually sent in any information or given us their contact um, information. Great. Chair, that, that, that sound appropriate to the rest of the commission? Is that Mr. Chairman? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, we did talk about Oxford Road. The county manager did not bring that up. We'll, we'll include that as a revision because Oxford sidewalks on Oxford Road are a part of this proposal. So when we bring back the revision to the sales tax project list, um, I, my expectation at, at this moment is Oxford will be a part of that. Um, it is identified, sidewalks are identified as part of that um, sidewalk study, the Kittleson study on Oxford. So I, I think we understand not in the, on the residential streets, but maybe on the, on the, the Oxford because it's a major spine through that neighborhood. Understood. Okay. All right. Um, anything else, Ms. Gay, for your report? I, I have several other things. Um, any, if we're if we're done with English estates, we have um, I have a I have a list of other things. Some of them quick, and some of them not so quick. So um, I have a CARES update for you. Would you like me to start with that? What, whatever is best for you. All right. I'm going to try to share my screen with you. I don't have my coach here, so we'll see how that works. All right, can you see it? Uh, I don't know how to, now we can see it. Maybe make it bigger? I don't know how to do that. Um, I don't know how to do that. Can you, I, I tell you what, why don't I, oh, here, here we go. Shani, is Shani gonna, my coach is here. She's gonna get this on. Okay, now you're on the spot. Now she's gonna make it work. I'm sorry, I apologize. No um, we, can, we can deal with the technical issue separately because I know Tim can help me and I can do the other quick things I have. You wanna do that first? Sure. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not, my technology is not my strong suit. Um, I, I have a couple of quick things for you. Um, the, um, I, as you know, we have a contract with District 5 for our medical examiner services. Um, and um, 
we have Dr. Wolf serves as our medical examiner. We have received a request from um, the medical examiner board um, asking us, um, they're looking at retaining her and they want to confirm that we're comfortable retaining her as the medical examiner for District 24. I would like to send them a favorable rating. Um, she's been fantastic. I know that law enforcement enjoys working with her. The uh, state attorney's office has been very pleased. We, for the first time under this contract, have our own investigators in Seminole County as opposed to from Volusia County. So that's one item I'd like to go ahead and move forward with, um, sending in a favorable um, recommendation for retention. Uh, hopefully the, the commission all received the communication this past week in regards to that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Delari. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to uh, recommend to the uh, medical examiner's group, uh, District 5, as uh, the county manager suggested that we're in favor of oh. them. Second, Lockhart. Thank you. I will call the roll. Delari. Aye. Lockhart. Aye. Kerry. Aye. Constantine. Constantine. Yes. Then Bauer, yes. Bauer, yes. Okay, looks like you've got that, Ms. Gay. I, I got you. I've got, I got my technical assistance in here now. Great. All right, I was doing better than Tim. I just want the record to reflect that. <laughs> Okay, how does that look? How I move that forward? Right, here we go. Okay. All right. Can you see that, everybody? Am I muted? Okay. All right, can you see that? Yes. Here, can you hear me? Okay, two minutes. Yes. Okay. All right, so I wanted to just give you a quick update on where we are on CARES Act, and I'll jump right into um, this is the recommended allocation chart um, that I showed you last go around. Um, it is slightly modified, um, and the categories that we modified were, um, you can see under individual assistance, we had originally suggested um, 10 million in that category. It's now 11.1. .1. That um, additional 1.1 million um, reflects the um, funding that the governor recently announced for rental and mortgage assistance um, through the SHIP program. The other item that we're able to use, in that, that, use that money for is um, is emergency repairs. And we're looking right now at working with um, Meals on Wheels. They have a number of emergency repair programs um, that they're trying to they're trying to move forward um, and have had some challenges due to the pandemic. So we're gonna be working with them on that. So this, this column doesn't add up to 82 and change. It's 83 and change now because we've added that additional 1.1 million. Uh, the other thing I did is I shifted um, two million dollars from the replenishment fund into the special economic recovery initiatives. Um, that is where we're going to do the additional tourism marketing. Um, we're, we've been trying to work with the hotels as well to do some special incentives for them, but also workforce training. We um, and I'll talk to you a little bit further into this um, presentation about what we're talking to Seminole State about with respect to workforce training. But I felt like we needed a little bit more money in there because we've got some good projects moving up. So, um, so any questions? This is just an updated. Um, chart for you for um, the proposed allocations thus far. So um, this next slide um, shares information with you about the portal that we talked about. Um, this is what we're working with Ernst & Young on to, um, to have a portal through which we can provide um, the business assistance and um, the individual assistance that direct assistance that's so necessary here in the public. Um, we've had some great meetings with them, already started working on it. Um, and this is just gives you a summary of sort of what we're um, what we're going to try to accomplish through that portal, um, a one-stop place where folks can go. We ha we'll have a team with Ernst and Young reviewing all of the applications. As you can see, we'll have a bilingual call center and validation team um, to try to make sure we can reach all of our all, all the segments of our community. Um, so you've got that um, just as a reference. 
um, if you have um, questions about that. Here is the schedule. We kicked off our meeting with Ernst & Young last week. We are, we are doing the behind the scenes, getting the whole infrastructure um, stood up. You can see they have a system called FASTER, which is not our fleet system, as you might um, be familiar with that term. But um, this just gives you the, the schedule. As you can see from this schedule, um, we intend to go live um, on the 19th of August um, with the portal for the small business support. And then on the 26th, we'll go live on individual assistance. Um, but I don't want you to think that we're not continuing to work with the business community and individuals um, in the interim. I'll, I'll share a little more um, on what our efforts are on that as we move forward through this um, presentation. Um, as a reminder, this is what we talked about last time on small business assistance, um, the $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 tiered um, scenario. Um, the existing program that we opened up in June uh, most of those businesses are now, instead of being in the $5,000 category, are going to be in the $10,000 category. So good news for the business community there. Um, and as you can see from this slide, that phase one, which was under the CDBG money, um, we've approved 115 um, applications for a total of $1.1 million. That would have eaten up the entire initial allotment through the CDBG program. So we'll be cutting checks this week for those, um, for those grants. We had another group in that initial set of applications that either didn't meet the qualifications because they were home-based or some of them um, uh, were beyond, CDBG had some, some um, income limits for employees. So um, we had some applications that were disqualified under that funding source that now will qualify under this funding source. So we're gonna continue to, um, to work with about 160 applicants that weren't qualified under the initial program and who also, um, another 120 applicants that we're still trying to help them get their paperwork together. And then you can see phase two this week, we're continuing to work on the portal to get the larger program stood up. Um, again, I won't go through all of this. I, I sent you all, sent you this presentation so you have it as a reference so you can see kind of what the what the scheduling plan is for this as we get the project stood up moving up to the week of August 17th which is when the portal will actually open we will start doing um, information developing webinars Facebook paid um, Facebook live programming to help folks start to get their application materials together so that that when the portal does open on the 19th they'll be ready to go and hopefully have complete applications um, and we won't have to be doing what we're doing right now, running down paperwork from folks. Um, uh, uh, we wanted you to be aware that Ernst & Young has um, shared with us, they're, they're already, they stood up the um, business assistance program in Hillsborough County. They were, as you recall, one of the first 12 to get money. Um, only about 20% of the folks have all their paperwork in hand um, when, they, when they submit their application. So take, there's a lot of time, it takes about two hours to process an application. Um, and um, we have streamlined some of the required paperwork, so hopefully we'll have better results than Hillsborough did. Um, additionally, we have a maximum, um, part of our criteria, as you may recall, that we talked about last go around was um, if you got um, any assistance from the Pay to Check Protection Plan, um, you, you can't have received more than $100,000 under our program in order to be eligible for funding through our small business assistance program. That's actually significantly higher than what we've seen in other programs around the state. Um, so we think that's an appropriate amount. We will say uh, we have already heard from some businesses that have gotten hundreds and hundreds of thousands through the PPP program. Um, we may come back and revisit that, but we'd like to help the folks that have gotten the least amount of help so far. So, um, so right now the criteria stands at no more than $100,000 of PPP um, assistance in order to qualify under our small, our small, our small business um, assistance program. Um, and then we have a whole pr um, plan for promotions of this grant program that ties in with the other schedule for standing up the portal. Um, you can see all of the items that we're um, putting together, the website launch, social media, meetings with chambers, um, outreach into the community to try to get folks ready to go as soon as we open the portal on the 19th. Um, you can see the week of August 3rd is our getting ready um, our promotion, and then the next week is our counting down promotion, and then the portal will launch. 
and we'll continue reaching out with the business community. I, I know there were some discussion about working with the small business, um, business development center over at the port. We have been talking with them um, to try to make sure that we've got the business community ready to go um, and we can start getting direct assistance out to our businesses as soon as possible. Um, individual and nonprofit assistance. Um, this is just a reminder of how we set that up with respect to the, um, the, the assistance programs. Um, for both um, individual, up to $5,000 for individuals, three months um, worth of assistance, and then nonprofits will be um, reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, individuals, so far, we have approved funding under the initial allotment that the board gave us for 195. People were, were looking at another 500 applications. Um, so far, we've approved over $300,000 in individual assistance. Um, of that, only 75000 has come from the CARES Act. That The remainder will be reimbursed back to the county through the CARES Act. But a lot of that money was from our other grant programs or from general fund dollars that you initially um, allocated. We'll be able to recoup those now from the, um, from the CARES Act funding. Um, with respect to nonprofits, we hope to have the application process and, and documentation um, that's going to be necessary for that um, released at the end of this week. Um, the county attorney's office is working on the subrecipient agreements. Um, as I, uh, as you may recall, all of the nonprofit awards will come to the board for approval. Um, we think that they're they're going to be um, that there's not going to be a lot of consistency because all of our nonprofits have different needs. So so we would like for the board to weigh in on those approvals. Um, uh, the other category we had was public safety service and health expenditures. These are our governmental partners. Um, as you, as the governor has asked us, while the counties are responsible for the money that we share it with our constitutional officers and our cities, we're going through the submissions from all of those agencies. Um, as you can see, county departments, both what we've spent and what we anticipate spending, um, we're at about $18 million there. The cities have submitted requests and we're in the neighborhood of $4 million. We're still sorting through what might be FEMA eligible versus what might not be FEMA eligible. We've also gotten submissions from the, um, all of the constitutional officers, um, except for the supervisor of elections. They're getting, they get their own allocation through the CARES Act, so they'll be getting almost half a million dollars to address their needs for the election in response to COVID-19. Um, as I mentioned, we're vetting all of these right now. Our, our primary um, focus right now is direct assistance. We really want to be able to get the money out to the community, to individuals and businesses. Not to say that we're not working on our, our governmental partners, but most of them have the funds and this is a reimbursement program for them. Um, we, our, our first priority is getting money to individuals and businesses. Um, we do have some time sensitive projects um, that are agency related. Um, Seminole County Public Schools has requested a little over $2 million to help supplement their CARES Act funding that they got. Um, we are, we're gonna continue to move that forward pretty quickly. We'll probably bring that back to you for um, final authorization, either on the 11th, probably on the 11th because they're, they open up on the 24th. So we're, we're trying to get, or no, I'm sorry, the Seminole State opens on the 24th. But we're going to try to get these before you very quickly. Um, the efforts with Seminole State College are for the workforce development program. Um, we're looking at between a million and two million dollars to do workforce training. They start on the 24th. Um, so we want to keep these moving very quickly and we'll, and, and we'll try to get money or at least to subrecipient agreements with them so they can move forward with these efforts as quickly as possible both great community projects um, and, and we're really excited. We're happy to be able to help the schools, but also really excited about the workforce um, development. We're working, the college is actually leveraging some other grant money. So again, um, really making the most of the money that we're getting here. As we look at the other um, expenditure requests, both from the county and, and all of the other governmental partners, our vetting, our vetting process includes looking, just getting all the information we need to make sure it's going to be CARES Act eligible, determining eligibility for FEMA reimbursement because we do want to leverage those dollars. I sent all of you some information last week that we got from the, the Florida State Department of Emergency Management. And as we feared, um, they're going to take a much more narrow look at reimbursement under their public assistance program with FEMA for this um, event as 
as opposed to what they do for hurricanes. Um, probably um, a lot of the things that we've done, like putting in plexiglass and other protective measures that we would have normally thought would be covered under the FEMA reimbursements will not be. So the reimbursement number for, um, for our, our public agencies is probably gonna shift a little bit because we're not gonna get as much back from FEMA as we originally anticipated. Um, we thought they might say, you're getting the CARES Act money, so use that. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is establish standardized guidelines for personnel cost reimbursements, leave, things like that, and any prospective purchases that any of the agencies might have as opposed to things they've already expended on. Availability. Ms. Gay, you're dropping out. Can you hear me? There you go. Okay. Um, this last bullet about developing need criteria based on funding availability, um, we want the money to go where it's necessary. Um, and one of one of the things that's come up as a as a point of discussion, and um, I think the press has, the, and I know it's a point of discussion because the press contacted um, us last week about it. Um, we were posed with a question about. Um, about the, the transfer of CARES, for, CARES Act funding to local governments that are giving raises to their employees this year. And it was sort of an interesting concept, took me off guard, number one, because I didn't, I didn't realize that any other governmental agencies in Seminole County were giving raises to their employees. Um, my understanding is six of the seven cities have salary adjustments included in their budgets this year. Um, and the question that was posed to us is if they have money, um, this is by the press, and I, I think maybe I think maybe Chairman Zimbauer, you were approached as well by the press on this. Well, I just, yeah, and, and all, uh, I, I was hit between the break, between this morning and this afternoon session uh, by the media on that exact topic um, so, that, so that my board understands that my statement was, well, I haven't seen... <laughs> What they propose to do but i personally as a businessman and as an elected official i don't know how i can look uh you know the, the private folks and honestly in the face with a straight face and say i'm giving raises while your business is going out of business and why you know, your family's trying to figure out how to feed your family and or you've lost your job so um you know th that that's a something that uh i think we've had discussion during our budget session that uh, like Commissioner Kerry indicated and Delari that they were here back in the downturn and you have to hit this early. Uh, so you're not stuck having to lay, and lay people off. You gotta get ahead of the curve uh, before, you know, something goes real wrong. So uh, that was my comment. So, so we're going to talk to the cities about that. I, I just want the board to be aware of it because it, it came up, we, we had a, some, a, a, I guess last Friday I was approached and um, was kind of surprised. I, I just didn't realize it didn't ever occur to me that other that other jurisdictions were giving raises. Um, but the question was, if they have the money to do that, do they need the CARES money? Maybe it should go somewhere else. So, so just so you know, that's a, you may hear that from some of your um, colleagues in other in other jurisdictions, and we'll talk with the cities about it. But that is something that we'll 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 discuss as we're talking about distributions to other public agencies. Um, Let's see. Um, the next, and I, I'm, I know I'm going very quickly, and, and please, uh, I'll answer any questions you have. But I know it's been it's been kind of a long day, and I have a couple other things to talk to you about. Um, under strategies and considerations, one of the things that we're really focused on is leveraging other funding awards and deadlines. And I wanted you to see, um, I wanted to give you a listing of all of the different funding and, and grant awards that that we're receiving under the CARES Act or related to COVID. Um, and the one at the top is, is the big dog, the $82 million that we're getting from Treasury. Um, and then as you're aware, we have some, some ESG grants for homelessness, CDBG, um, you're aware of that. Um, the SHIP monies that we just received, I, I mentioned the Supervisor of election is getting, Elections is getting some direct funding. I wanted to give you a, a list so that you would know everything that we were receiving. And I am sorry, I'm going to correct this. It's not 41 million. That should be a dollar sign in front of the one. It's 1 1.2 million on the CDBG. My, my, I just got excited for a minute. We'll get you a corrected um, report that has that. I apologize for that. 
um, that should be 1.2 million and not 41 million um, under the CDBG. But one of the things I want you to see is that the grant term, and we've got a lot of these funds expire in December, but some of them don't expire until 21 or 22. So we're, and some of them are more restrictive than others. The, fortunately, the, the big pot of money, the 82 million is really the least restrictive of them all. And, um, and we will, um, so, so we'll use that where we, where we can't use other funds. Um, but I just wanted you to know, these are the things that we're considering as we start to decide what lines we're gonna pay for things out of um, and when we're gonna pay for them. We will be able to continue to provide COVID related assistance after December 30th with some of these programs. Most of them are the individual assistance programs. So we're, we're kind of putting those monies aside and using what we have to use um, by the end of the year first. Um, and um, so we've also got some other, um, this shows some other monies that we're hoping to get that, we, that we're pursuing, um, some grant monies that we wanna also use to leverage so I just wanted you to be aware as, as we try to, it, it's Lori and her team are really having to keep track of a lot of different lines and a lot of different dates. Um, but we're gonna, we are, are, are committed to, to getting the most out of the funds that are coming to this community and helping the biggest number of people and businesses that we can um, by being smart about how we allocate these dollars. Um, and with that, I know I was, talking very rapidly, but I wanted, I had a lot to tell you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might want to have, that you might have regarding any of that or anything else that I didn't bring up. So, um, and I'll go to Commissioner Kerry in just a moment. Um, so, Nicole, I know back in June, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the board and some of these monies, including the CBDG monies, versus, that we were very concerned about getting this stuff rolled out sooner rather than later. Um, and looks like we're talking best case we're going to start taking applications on the business front august 19th which i don't know how long it's going to take the application process to get vetted maybe ernst and young has the program nailed down and we'll have it in 48 hours 72 hours any idea on the 19th when a business would make the application, what is the thought process and time before they'd actually get money in their hands? A lot of it, Chairman, depends on how complete the application is. Um, it as I said, it takes about two hours to review an application and, and, and make sure all of the appropriate documentation is there. The biggest challenge we've had, we, you know, we've, we've up to date awarded over a million dollars in direct assistance those checks are going out this week for the small business assistance and about four hundred thousand in individual assistance a lot of that will go very quickly because we awarded it in a one month increment and now you've authorized a three month three months of assistance so a lot of folks that have already gotten assistance will get additional assistance um i, I will t i know it seems like a lot of time and staff is shaking their head right now because i keep telling them we're not moving fast enough we're not moving fast enough but we, Hillsborough County, and I'll just use them as an example, they have, they got their money in April. They haven't even stood up their individual assistance program yet, and they're using Ernst & Young. So I think we're, we understand how critical it is to get money into, into the economy and, and into people's hands. Well, we're hopeful. And I, and, and I understand that, mm -hmm. um, and, and I get that, but here's the problem. And I know you and I have discussed this before, if you go to the business tab on our website, we just this week got a small little blurb updating. We've been at press conferences talking about, we're gonna be doing this with the CARES money, we're gonna be doing this, we're gonna be doing this. Uh, now going on almost a month, it'll be a month tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And yet we're just now getting something on the website. To me, here's my fear. My fear is, by the time we get the money in the hands of the people that really need it, it's of no benefit at all. And therefore, it's a it's a waste of staff time. We we can't resurrect their business once it's you know gone. Um, and I understand we have all these restrictions and guidelines and things and hoops we got to jump through. I understand that. That's why I was pushing for staff or or, or when we can get the information to start getting something on the website for these businesses 
in advance of what documents they may need to gather instead of waiting till the 19th when they get a list of things they have to gather. And I, and I know staff's got a lot of things going. I got that. But my fear again is by the time this money gets in the pockets of the small business people and those persons that need it, it's too late. And we may be sitting here with a pile of money that we can't even spend. I mean, that's my concern. And Chairman, we're, we're starting to do that. If you, if you look at that schedule, um, that, that information we had to get, we had to make sure that, that that Ernst and Young, we were getting everything that Ernst and Young said we needed to have because they're they're in fact they're not taking any more local government. Uh, we're, we're lucky we got them. They're not taking any more local, local government um, clients to do this. They're so it's just so labor intensive to do this. Um, and and they've already been through it with Hillsborough, and they still it's still significant changes to their program that they have to make in order for us. And we mimicked Hillsborough as much as we could just to keep it easy. Um, but we're. You can see we've got three weeks before we're going to open the portal. They're starting now to put information out there, and we finalized everything we need with Ernst & Young. Our hope is during the next three weeks, people will be getting their paperwork together. It's as, it's as, ex, it's as streamlined as we could make it and still demonstrate to Treasury that we're spending the money on what we're supposed to be spending it on. Um, it is a it is a government grant program, and I know, I know that everybody's anxious about getting money out, but considering the time it usually takes to spend federal dollars. I, I think we're, we're, we're moving pretty quickly on it. Um, but we do have, they have a whole separate promotions plan and I and I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but I can go back and talk with you about it or you guys can look at it. Um, and I think Trisha's on standby and I see Joe's on the phone. I, I don't know if they want to add anything, um, but I, I can, I understand the urgency. Everybody on staff understands the urgency. Um, and it just, it is, it is something that we just don't have the infrastructure for. None of the counties do. Um, and so we're all kind of struggling through this to get money out. We will this week have a million dollars of, of checks. The clerk's office has been wonderful working with us and in, in trying to get these checks out to the community. But, but this week we will have a million dollars go out to um, individual businesses. I mean, as I said, we're continuing to pump money out to individuals. I, I understand, I, but that's that's a program that started back in in June. June, mm -hmm. um, but and I'll go to Commissioner Kerry, who's been waiting patiently, and I think Commissioner Lockhart. Um, I would only ask. My fear is exactly what I've already said. By the time the deadline hits, if we get mired down in not having staff or we're not equipped to do it. Maybe we should spend a couple million dollars in CARES money to bring consultants or staff in to spend this money and get it into the hands of people sooner rather than later. That's just an idea. I don't know if that helps, but Chair, uh, Chairman, that's that's just what we're doing with Ernst and Young. They're, that this is how this is the fastest it can move. I mean, that's what we're doing with them. Is they're they're the ones that are supposed to help us expedite getting the money out. Um, and honestly, I, uh, and I, I'm not trying to make excuses, um, but I, I think we're probably moving faster than most other counties in the state. Well, no, and, and I can appreciate that, but finishing last out of everybody finishing last is no position to be beneficial right. in. <laughs> so I, I know you understand what I'm, what, what my mm -hmm. guest is and what I'm pushing for, but I continue to talk to these small businesses and it's not pretty. I mean, you got, you've got people now that haven't been able to pay their rent or their mortgages for three months. You've got people that have lost half their staff or they can only work with half their staff because the government says they're only allowed to work 50% capacity. Um, it's not pretty. And I don't want us to get mired down in that. Uh, so anyway, I got it. Uh, we, and we've got businesses, you saw 120 businesses that we still don't have all the paperwork on that we've been working with since June. I mean, part of it is- Sure. Yeah. And that and that balls in their in their field, but we should work with the business development people as well yeah. as the, the the local chambers in assisting those as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And I understand there'll be people that will make application that probably shouldn't be making application, but there are a lot of people that need need some assistance. Agreed. Commissioner Carey. Well, 
Uh, along those same lines. So, you know, my concern is timing. And you're right, there's a lot of people that will be out of business by August 19th, which is when you're going to open the portal. So I think that, you know, maybe you could, you know, recruit the college, maybe that they have accounting uh, people, let people apply with paper rather than a portal until you get this portal stood up. Listen, there is there should be a checklist of documents needed for businesses and a checklist for documents needed for individuals on our website right now to say, if you are gonna apply for this, you need you know, financial statements, tax returns, bank statement, whatever, whatever it is that you're going to require them to submit with their application. And the application should be there with the list of requirements already. They could be ready. So when the portal opens, they're ready to go and ready to submit. But I would tell you that you need to either hire temporary staff or partner with the college and their accounting department or, you know, um, ask for a group of volunteers, ask the people at the, at the, um, out at the port in the business community, maybe the chambers have some people who can help you at least evaluate to make sure all the documentation is there. That's pretty simple. That's a clerk function, you know, to say, Yep, you got two years worth of tax returns, you got two years worth of financial statements, you got six months or 12 months worth of bank statement, whatever their criteria happens to be. And, um, and you know, and put on there, you know, we're not going to review this until you have a complete application. But I think we should be doing it manually. And I think we should be asking all our community partners, if you got anybody you can loan. So here's another idea. Remember, United Way used to get loan. They used to get executives on loan to go out and help them with stuff. I think that we, think should, that we should ask our community partners to help us and maybe loan us an executive that's not working or who can't work in the office or maybe, you know, that, that we could pay temporarily. A lot of people have already lost their jobs, so I think there's opportunity out there. But I just got to tell you, if you're not opening this individual portal until August 26th, I mean, the 19th is three weeks away. The 26th is even five, is five weeks away. If you're going to drop the check in the mail, that's a whole nother week because the mail service doesn't run in two or three days like it used to. They have less drivers. They have less people. Even when you're paying premium, that should have been a two-day delivery. It's four. So... I mean, I'm with Commissioner Zimbauer. These people are going to be out of business um, before we ever get them the money. And, you know, and and we still haven't seen how the one individual, the hairdresser, the barber, the, those people are actually going to get um, assistance. So, Commissioner, Commissioner, they can apply now. Through, we have 500 applications we're processing right now uh, for individual assistance. And we've got another 160 that we're working on on the business side, plus the 120 that still haven't given us their paperwork. We are already working with the folks at the port. I will Mr. tell you. I will tell you quite frankly. I, I'm, I'm my, my Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Constantine. Thank you. I'm sorry, but everything that we're hearing right now, I heard our county manager say she's doing. So, I mean, we can rehash this over and over and over again, but the fact of the matter is, I think she's doing exactly what we're saying we want her to do. So, I mean, she can't pull rabbits out of a hat here, guys. Let's, you know, she's getting the job done. I understand we want to do it faster. I think we, she's got the message, but the fact of the matter is everything that we're saying we should do, she says we're doing. So, I, I mean, we, do we want to keep going over and over and over this? Well, I, I, th I think from my perspective, Commissioner Constantine, all I'm trying to emphasize is if you need more assistance, need more help, um, I'm happy to reach out to whoever, or if you need this board to make a decision on staff or some other and i agree with you that you yeah. need uh i'm willing to to have that discussion and i'm agree with you mr chairman and i think that our county manager got that message loud and clear 
And and we are that that's the point of Ernst and Young, and the the information for the portal will be on the for application items for the portal will be on the website Friday. We we finalized all of that with Ernst and Young. I I wish I wish that I had a checkbook sitting here and I could write checks to everybody right now. If I could if if we could do that, we would. Um, but at the same time, you are going to be on the hook for eighty two million dollars. <laughs> Um, and so we want to make sure that, that we're doing it right. And I think we're doing it as, as quickly as we can under the circumstances. Sure. Uh, Mr. Applegate's been waiting patiently and then Commissioner Lockhart. Well, uh, Nicole just uh, seems like I'm getting beat to the punch all day. Uh, Nicole just beat me to the punch. <laughs> we have to be very careful. It would be great to, that we can just start recruiting people off the street to help. But we are on the hook for $82 million. And the audits are going to start very soon. And the problem with that is if we screw up, then forget about the rest of the money. We're going to lose some money. We're going to be paying this for a long time. So we are being very careful. And I, I got uh, two attorneys working on this pretty much full time with uh, helping Nicole and her staff out. Uh, and I will say Nicole and her staff are moving very rapidly compared to what I'm hearing around the state from other other counties, but it is frustrating. Um, we wish we had that magic wand, um, but uh, the audits are going to come, so we want to be very careful. Well, and, and I understand and I appreciate that, but we're not going to be on the hook for eighty-two million dollars if it doesn't get spent. And maybe we spend twenty million, maybe we spend thirty million, whatever that number is. Um, and I get it. This is a new program. I, I get it. We're, we want to get the speed. I get it. We want to be sure that our taxpayers are not on the hook for this money. But the bottom line is they already are. This money is coming from the feds. It's taxpayers money to start with. So we're, we're going to be paying for it no matter what. Um, it would seem to me if Ernst and Young has already done this somewhere else, it should be just a matter of plugging the system in and then just training our staff accordingly or working hand in hand with our staff. I don't know. That's just, that's just my thought process from a business perspective. Um, and I've been proven way wrong many times since I've arrived here from a government side, how much longer it takes to get things done. I just start writing checks, get it done. But that's a whole nother program. But I understand what you're saying. Mr. Lockhart. I, I don't I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I and Commissioner Constantine, I understand what you're saying, but I think there are some specific things that we asked to have happen at our last meeting, and I just want to have clarification on whether or not they've been done. Did we add a list of documents that are likely to be needed to the website? Is it there now? It will be there Friday. We had to we had to work that out with Ernst and Young because they're the ones they number one, they they have done this in Hillsborough already. They're the ones are, that are helping us with the audit. So do we have the list from them now? Um, I, I think we, that we do. I'll have to check okay. with Tricia. But. So I, I happen to know that it doesn't take much to get someone on there real quick and, and every department has the ability to update their website. And I think you and I, maybe and Allison had talked a little bit at the last meeting about there's opportunities to update that community assistance um, website. So mm -hmm. I think that if we can get that list of specific documents and start via social media, through the chambers, through the school district, through the college, through the SBDC saying, here's the list of doc documents, start getting them together now. I think, you know, at the risk of making it look like we're micromanaging, I think it was, I think it's a very simple thing that we're just trying to help get the community prepared and ahead, just like we do with hurricane season. We know it's coming June 1st. Get your supplies together now. We advertise it everywhere. Even if we can utilize help with, with um, the media, you know, Channel 13 is always begging for something to run every hour. If you're going to apply for small business assistance in Seminole County, these are the documents you need to start gathering. We we can't just we can't wait to we can't we just can't we need to do everything well, we can to help people get prepared. And I think that's what we thought was happening last time. And I understand the whole Ernst and Young thing, but but to Commissioner Zembauer's point, Nicole, if you need 
additional staff, even if it's temporary staff that we need to hire to help people gather their information to help them, please ask us if you need that authority to do that because we we got to we got to move faster than fast and i know no. that staff is super busy but if we need to hire extra help we can do that i would agree and, and i think i i don't know what all documents ernst and young is going to say or needed but i as a business person i got a pretty good idea that would be a very short list of documents to be able to prove ownership income uh, payroll, uh, outst outstanding debt, solvency, uh, business license. Uh, I can't imagine it's that big of a list, but uh, it's not. It's not that big a list. We still have 120 people from the first round that are, we're waiting on documents for. Um, so I, I, but we, Trisha, Trisha just sent me a message there. We don't have the website stood up, but we'll stick a list out there. I just want you to know it's not. It won't be we the CARES site. We don't have to have our website, the Ernst & Young portal up. We have a website currently. We can start, we can put it on there, put all the information on there and start blasting out that link so people can at least see what documents they need to start getting together. I, I, if, just, even if I you think put we're an overcomplicating this. Yeah, even if we put an asterisk by it says, these are the list of documents, there may be additional required at least they've started the process is, is I think what we're hearing. And, and we can do that as, as, as long as everybody recognizes it's not, a, you know, we, we've got some criticism that it was difficult to navigate the site last time. So we're trying to address the comment that it'd be easy. And so I, I, we're, we're getting, we're trying to respond to make it easy for people, push a button. That's what we're trying to do. And, and now you're telling us just throw it out there. And so we'll, we can do that too. I, well, I'm I, Nicole, I don't think we're telling you just throw it out there. I think what we're trying to do is set the table for the feast. Mm -hmm. If you set the table with a small list in anticipation of if it's the 19th, then these companies will already have a binder ready to go of, I guess, the majority of the documents we could ever want instead of waiting till the 19th, tell them what they not, they've got to get, and then taking the next two or three weeks to try to help them get all those documents or help them understand what those are. I think that's all it's being saying. That, oh, and, and Chairman, let me be clear though, we were never waiting until the 19th. And, and I, I, I would encourage you to go back and read sort of what, what I had in that presentation about what our plan was to start standing things up. Um, and, and Trisha has sent me something with three exclamation points. The site will be up on Friday. Um, so, but it, it was always our intention to get that information out there early, but we had to have the right information. And, um, and that is part of that. I wanted you to understand what we were doing over the next few weeks, which is why I included that in the presentation. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I probably should have spent more time on that. Yeah, oh, that's good. I understood. Commissioner Kerry. You're muted. Have you looked at the website? Our website. Have you looked at our website? At our, yeah. what do you mean our website? Our county website. Have you looked at our county website? Not today I haven't, no, but I have looked at our website. Well, one thing that we asked was put a button right on the front that somebody doesn't have to figure out where to go, but I just typed in assistance for an individual and it says right on our website that we're temporarily suspended applications for rental and mortgage assistance program. Um, once the online portal for CARES grant funding launches in August, applications will resume. Because uh, Commissioner, we have 500 applications that we're processing right now. Um, so to have them submit additional, they're gonna have to resubmit through the portal if they submit now. Okay. Any any new applications would have to resubmit through the portal. We've got 500 that we are working paper applications that we're working now, like you've asked us to do. We're okay. doing that now. And if we were to get more applications now, we can't process more than that right now. They'd have to reapply through the portal. So if you need more assistance, temporary or whatever, to it has been said a number of times now, to help review these 
files or these cases and whatever to get people assistance, then you just need to raise your hand and say you need some help. Because again, I think that that's, we're trying to give you the help that you need to help our people. I understand that. It will probably take us three weeks to get people trained to, to make sure they're, as Bryant said, Bryant's very concerned about us getting the right paperwork and he's right about that. I agree. But you know what? If you wait for three weeks before you start hiring them, then there are three more weeks to get them trained. It's so not three weeks. Ernst and Young is already on board. They're there. We've hired the people. We've hired the firm. We've hired all of the backup. We will have. And they haven't even been able to stand up Hillsborough County who started this, the first ones. I mean, that gives me a little concern. Well, they haven't been pushing. They've, they've stood up the small business. They haven't done the individual yet. They will stand up our individual on the 26th. I don't think that Hillsborough is pushing them as hard as we're pushing them, quite frankly. Understood. Okay. Anyone else on this matter? Sorry, Ms. Gay. That's okay. I, next one. Um, I, I assure you, this is the top priority of everybody on the team, and um, and we we recognize how okay. how important it is to this community. Absolutely. Um, okay. The next. Anything else on cares? Okay. Um, the next item I have, um, I want to get some direction from you on the airport property. Um, we sent, um, we've received three um, inquiries on, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, is the, is the, is the county attorney's waving at me. I don't is there I know. Something? I just, again, before we get into a, a lot of discussion on that, uh, I just want everyone to be cautious that there may be a, a decision down the road to go out for a request for a proposal or a bid. So I want to be careful in what we set this up. So, uh, okay, well, I, stop. If I say something, I shouldn't stop me. No, no, you're fine. We've talked about this yesterday. I'm, I'm advising mm -hmm. the board. That's all. Yeah. So um, we have received in, in the last couple of months, last month, um, three different um, inquiries with respect to property that we own at the corner of Red Cleveland and um, East Lake Mary Boulevard. It's the retention pond um, that, that actually serves as a stormwater facility for East Lake Mary Boulevard. Um, we have received inquiries about acquisition of that um, piece of property, um, some different proposals, um, two from, um, from two private entities and then one from the airport itself. Um, and I'd like to get some direction from the board as to whether or not this is something that you want staff to follow up on and pursue or are you not interested in doing anything with the property at this time and we should just tell them that um, but I, we need to get back to folks and say you know that we're we're going to move forward and this is how we're going to do it or there's not an interest on the part of the county this time to entertain any um, any inquiries on acquisition. Commissioner Lockhart. So one of the questions I asked uh, last week, I think it was, was what, it, what is our existing policy about declaring property surplus or if somebody wants to buy county property, do we have a policy in place? And based on our discussion many, many, many months ago, back when we were meeting in person, I, I was left with the impression that perhaps we were without a policy because we were being asked what the board's desire was. Come to find out we actually have a policy in place or how something like this would would go. So I'm just wondering, is there a reason why we are not just following county the current policy and why we're we're asking for something separate and apart? I'm, yes. I'm perplexed about that. There there are a couple of issues at play here. Number one, the, the policy that we have for disposing of county property is typically when we declare a property surplus. So this is not a piece of property that the board has declared surplus. Um, it's it's an active retention pond um, that somebody has said we want to we want to take it and have it not be a retention pond anymore and build something on it. Um, it's an unusual circumstance. The policy that we have for disposal of property is for because we typically don't dispose of property unless it's deemed surplus. Um, so that's an unusual circumstance. The other unusual circumstance here is if the board wanted to deem it as unneeded. Um, 
it is an existing retention pond and and it's not just a matter of getting an appraisal and saying you know give us this much money for the property the the issue of stormwater storage for Lake Mary Boulevard is going to have to be addressed um, so so there are a couple of, of nuances here that it's not just as simple as um, yeah I don't I don't I don't know if you were on the board at the time. I, I think it was before you, you might have been with the county then. When we disposed of the property at the corner of Montgomery and 430, um, 436, the gas station there, that was just a piece of property that was surplus that we weren't using for any reason. So we were able to get an appraisal and then ask for bids on it. Um, this is different because it's an act, it, it's not really surplus. Um, you could deem it that, um, but we'd have a water issue that we'd have to also deal with. Well, and so I guess because not all three proposals are the same, right? Um, I'm curious why we wouldn't just then follow the. I don't know. I'm. I'm just. This is. This is unique in the sense that it's a unique situation. But I just. I, I think well, we should be reminded of what our policy is, and certainly what statute is for what this process should be. Because I, I think if we do decide we're going to declare this property surplus then it needs to be advertised and opened up to everybody right. and their uncle, not just these three individuals. And I think there might be some perception among these three individuals that they just mm -hmm. get to make an offer and then they get to buy a piece of property and you, you, we just don't do it like that. Right. So I think I, I'm, and, I'm hopeful that uh, all of the board understands what statute requires to dispose of public oh yeah. property. And I, I guess the threshold question is, are you interested in doing something with this property or are you interested in just keeping it a retention pond? I guess that that is really the first question is, are, are, are you interested in going through a process with this or do you just, it's our retention pond, we're going to keep it there. Commissioner Constantine and then Commissioner Carey. You're muted, Mr. Step one, this is not surplus property. So whatever we do, we have to ensure that, that, the, uh, that the pond that we need uh, is can, going to be mitigated in whatever circumstance, keeping the same or whatever. Number two, um, we need to let these people know that it's not necessarily that we want to get rid of the property, but we will entertain offers understanding that they need and whatever they want to use it for need to mitigate that drainage uh, that we have there and, and the, the holding pond. And, and then third, once we get those, we can decide whether or not we really want to sell it at all because we don't know what the offers are going to be. So I would never make this uh, surplus property, but I would certainly under the circumstances of allowing to ensure that we are taking care of the needs that we have in the county, uh, give them the opportunity to show us what they would use or what, how much they would pay for the property and what circumstances and mitigation they would use for the protection of the, of the wetland there and, and, the, um, and the drainage. Mr. Carey. Well, so when we did the property at Montgomery Road in 436, you might recall that we had highest and best use appraisals done on both that parcel and a 12 acre parcel on Lake Mary Boulevard. And we were going to actually do a swap about those properties. They were both worth a little over a million dollars. Commissioner Constantine brought up the fact that he thought we should put it out there. And so we put it out there to say, this is the minimum amount that we would take, the 1.1 or whatever it was that we had determined would make the swap whole. And we got $1.5 million for it. So then we were able to just take the 1.5, buy the one the other property for 1.1, and we had $400,000 for that property. That truly was excess property from something that had been condemned during the Montgomery Road project. And then, and, and then I don't know, last December maybe, um, when we had the request from Mr. Juarez about the easement over our property along Red Cleveland Boulevard. Um, at that time, we actually got, again, an unsolicited uh, proposal from the 
people that own the property adjacent to this that they had an interest in buying it. And I recall the board saying that, you know, giving direction to say, if we have somebody contact us and say, we'd be interested in this property, that we should consider those kind of things, especially if we're still allowed to have our purpose of the property. So in this scenario, we have three people that have basically said, we're interested in looking at this. And I would say that if you have an appraisal done for the highest and best use, not as a piece of property with a retention pond on it, but what could it be worth if you were able to develop it at the highest and best use, put a minimum bid on it. How are you going to deal with our retention pond and, and put it out there to say, okay, here's the proposal. Minimum bid of this, tell us how you're going to deal with your retention pond. And then we'll look at all the responses that we get and decide if we think any of them are worthy of moving forward. It's not surplus property. We're not deeming it as surplus. Somebody else has triggered this conversation by three different people by saying, we all have an interest. So I don't know if I'd be interested in selling or not, because I don't know what it's worth at its highest and best use. Uh, I, and I asked Bryant to weigh in on this because, because I think you have to declare that it's not needed in order to sell it. And so I, I so we'd have Mr. to Applegate? say it's surplus, but. Mr. Applegate, you want to weigh in on that? Well, just let me clarify that a little bit. Uh, I sent out a memo to all of you. Um, uh, hopefully you got that by now. Uh, outlining the different steps. Um, you can put out a proposal, uh, but you're going to be very careful about it. There's, you have great discretion. It's your property, but it was condemned for a particular use. Um, the time has passed where um, it would have to revert back to the prior owner because there, uh, the time period has run under the eminent domain statute. There wasn't a reverter clause. Uh, before we could agree, the board could agree with any owner or developer. I think you, you'll have to go out for a proposal. And as Commissioner Carey said, that proposal would have to address the issue of the drainage. Uh, and it would have to be opened up to everybody, not just the three that are out there. So I, when I cautioned you in the beginning, um, what I would recommend is if, if there is an interest in looking at um, considering one of the three or somebody out of the woodwork coming in, then have staff put together a proposal with engineering um, and submit it. But if you're not interested in selling the property, then I don't think there's any sense wasting everybody's time on the other side of this. Um, so. Mr. Carey, and, and I'm fine with that. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I saw in one of the offers, you know, was just some ridiculous price if, if it were a piece of property that we just had a pond on. And again, to me, if we're going to allow somebody to acquire public property to have the benefit of developing and seeking a profit from, then we would only consider selling it knowing the value of the highest and best use of that property. It's not as a retention pond. And that then the factor of the fact that they would have to take care of the retention pond, again, you know, if they're the adjacent property owner, maybe they can move it. If they're not, maybe they have to put it underground. Maybe they're not interested when they see that it's millions of dollars to go through this. You know, and, and I, if y'all want to look at it, those are my comments on it. But the other part of it is we got so much other stuff going on right now. I don't know that now is a good time for us to be trying to, you know, go through and figure out this process. But I'm fine with, with, with this if we want to put together a proposal. If you got three people that are asking. Or you just tell them we're not interested. Well, I think if we're going to do that. I think that we and, and you know, Brian, you said get with engineering and have them address it. I, I don't think that we spend time in engineering. I think we tell the proposers as part of the proposal that you have to tell us 
how you're going to deal with this yeah. amount of stormwater and and let them come up with it because yeah. that's what said. Right. if they're an adjacent property area maybe they're going to move it if not maybe they got a vaulted underground that's every scenario is going to be different but i think we should set a set a minimum price based on a highest and best use appraisal highest and best use of that parcel and the benefit that the whoever gets it um right. absolutely absolutely right yep i agree with that 100 percent and I meant when you're right about engineering, but I do want our engineers to make sure that we're putting something out there that, you know, could be feasible anyway. So, right. Well, you have to know the capacity of that stormwater pond, which is in their right. permit. I mean, they have to give you that. Yeah. Right. So I guess the question really becomes what, what direction does the board want to give staff? Uh, are you inter interested in entertaining or you don't want to entertain it at all? No sense wasting time if there's no interest. I, I'm not opposed to entertaining, putting it out there for the public to have an opportunity to bid on it, but you, there are some steps that we have to do before you're going to be able to get there. Get there. Right. I, I, I think both Commissioner Kerry and I said the same thing earlier, and I think that's the same. It, it, it's the truth. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to look at proposals. We've got to do our our due diligence and our work beforehand but um but i don't think that we have to necessarily going in, into this guaranteeing that we're going to sell it i right. think we need to understand that the proposals that we get may not be what we want to see happen and and agree you have that option to say thank you for all your proposals but we're not interested right so I'll put myself in that column as well. So there's three. Let's there's go on. Three. Let's move on. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else? The order of the day, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm trying to move move everybody along. Any any further discussion on that? Mr. Chairman, I would just say that when the when they get the appraisal back again, if it's a couple hundred thousand dollars, we're probably not worth. Nobody's going to be interested in wasting the time on that. But we don't know what we don't know. Agreed. Agreed. I agree one hundred percent. All right. So our our first step is we'll we'll get an appraisal. We'll we'll see if it's something that the board's interested in. After that, a highest and best use appraisal. I understand. Um, and um, there's some interest in sticking our toe in the water here is what I'm hearing. Correct? Well, it's That's nine acres know. or something in it and all nine acres is water. So yeah, I guess we are. I, I just hate for the, for the taxpayers to be, and for our staff to be, to be dealing with and funding an appraisal of a property that we would not be even considering going through these machinations if there weren't um, people knocking on our door. So um, I'm a little, concerned about that I, as long as this is opened up and advertised per state statute for two weeks so that anybody and everybody has an opportunity to come to the table um i'm i'm okay with that i just i've i've been listening very intently to the conversation about this issue over the course of many many months and i think there's some misperception that somehow we're just gonna decide which of these three we like best and you know, give it to to whomever, and that's just not the process. So I just wanted to make sure everybody. Not, that. Yeah, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, put it on the Wall Street Journal. I mean, call call an an auctioneer and bid it. I doesn't matter to me. I don't I'm know where that. I don't know where Commissioner Lockhart. I, I guess I need to understand. Are we talking about the same property, Commissioner Lockhart? The, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure about the right. months of understanding well, about this, somebody might get it or that I don't I don't follow that I'm not months and months ago. We, got, we got a request for this in December when we were having the other conversation we got a request if you remember at the 11th hour from the adjacent the Benham people yeah, yeah uh, but I don't know that how that's uh, anyway well maybe I misinterpreted what was said <laughs> When we did it on Montgomery Road, it was a sealed bid process after we had set the, all the criteria and said this, this, and that, sealed bid, opened the bids, high bidder, paid the money, and was able to do it. That's the way uh, it should be. We don't get, if we, if we see we're not interested based on it, 
groundwork that we need to do. If the board then isn't interested in going forward, then you don't do anything. Right. Confirmed. So I, I feel like I'm still getting conflicting. Um, I don't feel I have a consensus here. Um, it, it, this issue was raised several months ago in the context of the Red Cleveland easement issue, and there there was an inquiry. We have since received actually formal written inquiries that are that are more developed. So is is it sounds like maybe maybe not a complete consensus, but there's some interest in, there's some interest in looking into this and seeing what the value of that property might be if it were developed, and then if it looks like it's going to be significant. Uh, it would, it, would be, it would be much easier for staff to hear you say we're not interested in doing anything with it or yes we're interested go get it go get an appraisal and put together uh, an rfp yeah uh if for me if it benefits the taxpayer at the end of the day if it if it brings money in to offset the taxpayer's burden and serves the purpose of taking care of whatever drainage requirements we have in that area i'm fine with it and I am too. As long as our stormwater is addressed and we put the property on the tax rolls, now it's a property that's paying taxes. We are not paying taxes on it with it just sitting there with the retention pond on it. So Agreed. I mean, you just have to do your due diligence from the county standpoint to determine what the minimum mass you're gonna is gonna be in the mm -hmm. right. I mean that's, I'm that's my opinion. I, I'm fine with that. I think Commissioner Constantine, I think. Are you okay with that, Commissioner Constantine? Commissioner Lockhart, sounds like you're okay with it, right? Yeah, as long as we follow the process and, and okay. our, what we have in place. Commissioner Delari? I have no problem moving forward as long as the process is clear, as long as it's open to everyone, as long as we're following proper procedures set by the state of Florida. Yeah. We will work in tandem with the county attorney's office to make sure everything is done the way it's supposed to be done. Okay, I appreciate it. I, I, that, and I would just ask that you update the board and the steps along the way. Absolutely. Done. How much stormwater, and just they may decide to pull the plug. Right. Okay. Okay. Got it. Anything else from the yes. county manager? Yes. Two more things quickly. Um, the, the topic of interest-based bargaining has come up a number of times at the board, and um, I have received some some differing um, feedback um, and some representations with respect to the union's interest, um, our bargaining unit's interest in in pursuing some training and and um, walking down that road with respect to our next negotiations. So I talked directly with John DeVita, who all, you all know is the president of the union, and they are interested in the concept. Um, John himself has done a lot of his own research on it and finds it is he's intrigued um, by the process. Their concern is a timing concern right now. Um, as you can imagine, um, as busy as, as all of us are with COVID, our first responders are particularly taxed by it right now. Um, we would normally start neg open negotiations with them. They're, they're, the A unit contract ends September 30th of next year. Um, we would normally start this fall, starting to talk about what issues we might want to deal with. The, the union's biggest concern is taking the requisite time to do the training and, and to give the interest-based bargaining process the attention that it deserves. So they are interested in pursuing it, but but would like to maybe back burner it, um, and, and at the very least, not talk about doing a training until November. Um, and and so I, I just wanted to let you all know I've talked directly with them, and so we're going to continue to work with them to try to coordinate some training and, and make sure that we can take the best benefit, that make the most of the opportunity to do that. So I just wanted you all to know we're, we're going to work with that. It's not going to come up in the next month or so. But, um, but we're continuing, unless I hear differently today, we're going to continue to pursue that and we will coordinate with the, with the union to make sure it doesn't work unless we're, we're, both, um, we're, we're both buying into it. Um, and, and, and then bring back, um, 
none of you would actually be, of course, involved in the negotiations, but it is really important that if management and the union are going to go down that road, that you understand it. So you would be a part of any any training that we ha that we um, pursue in that respect. But I just wanted to to, to give you all because I think you've heard some differing things. Um, and, and hopefully John or somebody from his group is listening to this and can correct me later if I'm wrong. But but my discussions with him, um, which was recent as last Friday, is, yeah, they are interested in, in learning more about it and, and seeing how it might be beneficial and certainly getting some more training in it. But their their concern right now is just a timing issue. So um, so we'll keep working with them, as I said, unless I hear differently today. And, um, and we'll keep you posted on that as we get closer to November. Does that sound acceptable to everybody okay with me very reasonable i think the time frame is makes sense great okay so hearing no objection that, that's how we're going to pursue that and then the last um thing i just wanted to talk to you about our um meeting format um the governor's executive order expires in two days three days um, for virtual meetings, uh, and we don't have any indication as kind of been his typical um, approach to this as to what he might do. So I want you to know we have been working on what we're calling a hybrid. But the public and the board could attend remotely. If, if the governor doesn't extend his executive order, we'll have to have three of you on property, um, but two of you could still um, attend remotely. Um, we'll keep you posted on that if we hear differently. Um, the feedback that I have received from you up to this point is if the governor extends virtual meetings, we'll stick with that format. But if he doesn't, then we'll we'll go with a hybrid. I, I just want to confirm that that's still kind of the general thinking of the board, or do you want us to, regardless of what the governor does, do something else? I see everybody kind of smiling and... I, I I'll, I'll do whatever everybody's happy with. Personally, I, I couldn't get back to personal meetings sooner rather than later <laughs> myself. But I don't want to be unsafe or unhealthy or, you know, cause anybody any angst uh, because we would do that. I mean, live meetings would look very different than they do now. <laughs> right. Commissioner Carey? Uh, and, and I've expressed concern with, with uh, Ms. Gay about if we go back to live meetings, you know, that her and Bryant probably need to be on the floor. We need to be a little further spread apart. I mean, we got people out campaigning and doing stuff and, you know, I'm in that age group and, uh, and certainly don't want to expose my husband and family. The only thing I would want to confirm Bryant on a hybrid um, meeting that all votes would count, even if you were, if you were there virtually, um, that they would all still count. Uh, that is absolutely correct. They will, uh, all votes will count. And as a home rule county, uh, it's my opinion that we have great flexibility that maybe some other folks around the state would disagree with. But um, a hybrid system, your vote would count. Well, and, and honestly, I mean, even if you're spreading us out on the dais, if you're trying to put five of us up there and then you got the clerk right there, I mean, I would say that you know, we would have to ask uh, Clerk Malloy to not join us on the dais during this period that we need to be separate. I mean, I just think there's a lot of things if we're going to try to go back to a full live meeting. I think it's, I think what we need to get back where the public can come if they choose to. And I think you got a lot of how they would be there that we would keep them safe and not be exposing people. There's a lot of, a lot of moving parts. Right. Agreed. Okay. Mr. Delari. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I personally would love to get back to you as soon as we can uh, in live uh, meetings. And as long as we're following the rules, if three of us can be there, that'd be great. If there's a hybrid, and as long as we're following whatever rules that need to be followed, I personally will be there as long as we're keeping and following social distancing mm -hmm. and all the regs that we need to be following. Okay. Mr. So, Lockhart. Mr. Lockhart. Uh, just to say, you know, the hybrid I think is is a is a good idea. I it'll be interesting to see in practicality how it works out when you have some in person and and some at distance. And same thing with the public. Um, it we may want to even consider if there's another location for the meetings that might mm -hmm. allow for a larger space. I, it may not be as um, fancy as our board room, but maybe there's a larger space somewhere in their community. That's just an idea I'd throw out there. Um, the other thing that I'd 
I'd like us to consider, regardless of how we move forward, when we have um, applicants and people who have uh, signed into the Zoom meeting to talk to us, um, and it hit me today when Mr. Capro said, oh, I, I really, if I'd known I wasn't going to be on video, I wouldn't have bothered shaving this morning. It really could be beneficial if there's some way that we could allow folks to, to be on the video. I, I, there's so much that you miss with facial expression. And um, I, I don't know if that's a conscious decision that we've made to not allow some folks to be on video, but I, I, I've heard it now a couple of different times, even from community members who wanted to make presentations, that they had things that they wanted to share um, and, and be on camera. And so if, if there's a way that we could look at that, I would appreciate that. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily disagree. I would want to make sure that we don't get into a scenario much like some other jurisdictions did with the public calling in. If you're going to have the applicant showing up in person with video, then I think the public should have the right to do that as well. And how we would control somebody streaking across the screen during a public meeting or doing something vulgar that has happened in other jurisdictions is most unfortunate. Um, I know in radio and TV, we could control that because there's a delay, but so we can kill it before it ever gets broadcast. But we're live unless SGTV or I don't know how you would do it, but. Well, if someone wanted to be vulgar on the phone, they could be vulgar on the phone and say things that we couldn't keep them from saying as well. Oh, I, I got the drop button. I can drop them on that one. Well, maybe it'll do it with video too. Yeah. We have that ability with video. I just, I think by and large, the vast majority of people are not going to do something vulgar on the screen. They're yeah. legitimate. Oh, I agree. <laughs> who, who have the right, if they want to participate, to do it via video, if they can't be there in person. I didn't right. even know streaking was a thing again, so. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently. Oh. Uh. Uh, Commissioner Lockhart, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, why we don't do the video, but we'll find out. We'll, we'll see if there's a way to, to accommodate that. So uh, I, we've talked about the hybrid meeting. If if the governor extends the executive order, is it still the board's desire to do the hybrid or do we want to stick with the virtual if, if we're able to under the executive order? I, I'll do whatever the majority of the board would like to do. I. I personally would like to see us be getting together um, if it's well, safe and acceptable. And but I don't think I'm, we all I'm get together together in that chambers. It's not. It's just not physically possible for all of us to be on the dais and social distance. And I and I will tell you from a staff standpoint, we'll do whatever the board wants. Of course, it is much easier for us to manage one type of meeting. And try to manage our live meeting and a live meeting a meeting that's partially virtual and partially live we'll do it we can do it but i, I just want to tell you it might be a little clunky yeah. but but we'll, we, we'll we'll make it work if that's what the board wants if we have the meeting remotely in another location like the civic center or the convention or, you know at one of the hotel convention spaces or something like that where you could have a lot of you know room i mean that's an issue too for sgtv to be exactly yeah I mean, there's a lot of, uh, again, there's a lot of different parts, but I mean, you know, I guess if we had the, um, well, I don't know, I don't know the answer to it, but I'm, I'm with Commissioner Lockhart. I mean, it's very difficult to spread us all out across the dais. And like today, the clerk is recording this from home, you know, so they're taking the minutes from remotely and, and able to handle that. And, and so, um, I don't know. We'll just we'll just have to figure out some kind of plan, and then see what happens. I mean, we've got what a, a week till the end of the month, so we'll know in a week what the you know if the government sends us or not. Right. Uh, but. but from from an execution standpoint, my preference would be if the governor allows virtual meetings that we do the next one virtual, but, um, but I understand if the board thinks it's important that we, that we operate live. So. Mr. Chairman, I want to get live as soon as possible, but 
you know, the next meeting on August 11th, let's just make the decision that that's going to be virtual. But I want to get back to, you know, normal it, stuff. But it, the next meeting, I'm sorry? If the governor allows it. Yeah, yeah. If, if, the, this, if the governor yeah. allows it, that's yeah. right. If yeah. the governor doesn't allow it, we don't have a real, you know, we do the best we can. It was safety. But if the governor allows it, let's say the next meeting, 11th, is going to be virtual. But let's, I think we all want to get back to um, seeing each other, and, or maybe not seeing each other, but seeing the public. Great, everybody's good with that? Okay, thank with you, that. Uh, and, and, that, and that's all I have for you, but I appreciate, I appreciate the feedback, thank you. Okay, all right, uh, our county attorney, do you have anything else for us today, yeah. sir? Well, I was gonna joke with you and tell you I have 20 items, but uh, I actually have some good news. Um, while we were meeting today, uh, the circuit court uh, granted our motion to dismiss in the Levitt case, um, uh, basically confirming that we have the right, that you all have the right, um, uh, and Alan Harris has the right to order a mask to be worn in public. And um, it wasn't to me. Um, I'm just going to talk for a minute. I miss the camaraderie. I, uh, my staff will tell you that I'm a face-to-face -face person. I miss working with my staff in their offices. Uh, believe it or not, I actually do <laughs> work with them. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work they're doing from home. Um, but to me, it's mind-boggling to me that we have a group of people who are out there saying these horrible things about Alan Harris uh, vulgar things, um, saying that the government does not have a right to um, uh, require a mask during a pandemic. Um, and for lawyers who think they're constitutional lawyers who obviously have not read the Federalist Papers, because if these lawyers have, they recognize one of the founding principles in defending the adoption of the Constitution was a strong federal government, particularly in a time of a national emergency. And Supreme Court justices on both sides of liberal and conservative views throughout Supreme Court history has affirmed presidential powers and governor powers in times of national emergency. Just like the, the Supreme Court has said that um, the government has a right to tell churches they can't hold services during a pandemic. So um, uh, Lynn Porter Carlton has been following this issue from day number one, wrote an outstanding motion to dismiss a memo of law detailing the history of all this. And the Supreme or the, uh, the circuit court granted the motion without a hearing, which shows that they're not gonna waste their time on something like this. Now, it, of course, a motion to dismiss usually the first time around is without prejudice. So they do have a right. They want to file an, a new complaint, but um, judging from the rulings around the state, I can't predict what he'll do, you know, but anyway, uh, long day, but that's great news uh, coming out today. Fantastic. That's uh, what Leon, Palm Beach, and now Seminole County. Uh, yep, and I think there's a few others that are just around the corner from doing so. Alatra, um, Alatra County also had a federal court rule oh. that the government can require a mask as well as their circuit court. That's all I have today. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. We appreciate that very much. Next up, we are going to go to the commission reports. We'll start with District 5, Commissioner Carey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd just like to say that all of my ex parte communication will be delivered to the clerk's office on all of the items that we had today. Um, and then I'll just give you a quick update on the airport. Um, traffic at the airport is slowly ticking up. Uh, June passenger count was 137,000, which was up from 58,000 in May. Uh, Year to date count is only 840,000. Um, in 2019, the year to date was 1.6 million. So you can see 
it's a pretty tremendous impact still. Total reduction of 48% passenger count year over year. So, um, so still a struggle to try to kind of get back to some sense of normal. Uh, also, the uh, Orlando Sanford International Airport has announced their appointment of um, Tom Nolan as the airport uh, next president and CEO. Mr. Nolan is currently the executive director at the Palm Springs International Airport in California. Uh, he will be replacing Diane Cruz, uh, who, of course, was the first female president and CEO of the airport, and her retirement is September 30th of this year. Um, she's worked there at the airport for 19 years, and Mr. Nolan will uh, start on August the 19th, so that I'll have a little bit of time in the saddle with, um, with Diane. Uh, he's a native of Wisconsin. He has a degree in business administration and is an accredited airport executive as well as a private pilot. So for all of you, if you have an opportunity to welcome Mr. Nolan to the community, um, or if you're out at the airport after the 19th of August, you might stop in and introduce yourself to him and um, we wish him certainly uh, great success and certainly wish uh, Diane Cruz a happy retirement. So. Um, uh, we'll have a couple of reports before that gets here, but just wanted to update you on the fact that that decision has been made. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Carey. Next up will be District 3, Commissioner Constantine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This past month, the uh, Tourist Development Commission met. Um, they did approve the recommended, recommend, recommended budget, which will be brought Forth to us. Um, of course, we now, it was a little bit more um, easy to swallow, being that there would be dollars in the CARES Act that would be able to be provided to help us and we wouldn't have to go so far into the uh, reserves. Also, uh, in, on August 5th, um, we're going to have a uh, CAUNO meeting, which is going to be talking about the CARES Act. Uh, with the cities as well as the TDC budget. And um, that is still up in the air, whether it's going to be uh, virtual or there, we're gonna have some place we're hosting it. So whether we're gonna have some place that uh, we can do social distancing and, um, you know, and allow everybody to come and as well as the public. And that's all I have, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Constantine. Next will be District 4, Commissioner Lockhart. Thank you. Um, two things specifically related to the district, and I know we've talked a lot about English estates this afternoon, and I appreciate everyone um, spending time on that. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the, um, the shared network drive where um, staff was kind enough to upload documents, the one thing that I didn't see was the comments from the neighbors that were entered into the portal so all of those emails were in there. Unless the portal messages were, were mixed in with the emails, I wasn't able to discern that. So if there's a way that staff could get us all of the messages, comments that went in and, and, who, and, and who they're attributed to, um, I don't know if you can do that as a CSV export or something like that. I just would like to see those in addition to all the emails. Um, and then obviously circulate them to all of the other board members as well. And um, the Rosenwald School project is having its uh, community meeting and presentations of the um, the, pr the proposal proposers on July 30th. It's going to be held in the community. Uh, some folks will be able to be there in person and others will be able to participate by Zoom. And I wanna thank staff so much for figuring out a way to accommodate that process because that's something that, um, that the board was um, made, made a priority was that Rosenwald be something that would be a benefit to the East Altamont Wynwood community. And so because of staff's hard work, the community will be able to either view in person or view online the presentations that are made and give their feedback um, so that we can have that available to us 
before we make a decision about the outcome of the Rosenwald property. So, Can we make sure that all of the board members get an invitation, a link invitation to the Zoom meeting or the details about the meeting in person? Staff, if you could, Nicole, if you, if you could, thank you. Yes, got it. Yeah, I don't, I don't have that yet or I'd, I'd send it to you, but I'm, I'm excited about that for the community for sure. And then two other things related to um, admin code or the county code, I'm not sure. I think there's something about that would be relative to both of those codes. And it occurred to me when we were talking today about the junked and abandoned vehicles that the appeal process is something that I think up until now maybe has been pretty much reserved for the land development code. And if something was in the administrative code or in the in the um, county code that wasn't necessarily, there wasn't an opportunity for an individual to appeal to whether it be the county manager or to the board. So I would just like to know if there might be consensus on the part of the board to ask the county manager and staff to look at other areas of the admin code where there currently is no appeal process that might be beneficial for our citizens. Um, that probably should be an opportunity out there for them for other things as well. And if, if I could just add, I, I would encourage the board to to take a look at that. It, it, there are some challenges that are not uh, Staff sometimes sees situations that could should be maybe corrected and where our hands are tied. So without an opportunity for appeal or a waiver to a certain extent or both, um, Commissioner Lockhart's right. We we deal with that in land development code, but there are some other um, county codes that would be that would benefit from that as well. So I would just, for what it's worth, that's my two cents on that. I think that that's um, probably something that would be good for us to look at. I would I would absolutely support. You know, if, if legal wants to take a look at that, uh, what what areas would be beneficial to do that? I'm 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 okay with that, Commissioner okay. Carroll. Well, and I I'd, I'd like to see the list of you know what it is and who it goes to now because I know there was you know some things that were appealed to the county manager if a staff you know uh, rejected it and then we put language in that said that they could appeal that to the county commission because we're the only ones held accountable to the public and so. To me, there should always be an appeal process um, at some level to, you know, if they want to go through all the steps to get to someone to overrule. So I'd like to see the list of how we do it, different things. And we'll work with staff to find out where they are having the problems and we'll address it. Commissioner Delari? I have no problem having staff look at that. I think uh, Commissioner Carey is correct. Everyone should have, be able to have an appeal process. I would like to see the entire list as well as what the recommendation of staff and legal would be. I think you've got consensus, Commissioner Lockhart. Great, great, thank you. And then the, just the other thing related to um, the comments that were made about our emergency management process. Um, I feel a little more comfortable bringing this up now that um, the lawsuit has been somewhat addressed, but um, the, the way we are currently set up to handle our emergency management function, giving um, our emergency manager such broad discretion, I think serves us very, very well, given the fact that we have a phenomenal emergency manager. Um, obviously, we all know that most of what we deal with is hurricanes and fires and emergencies, not, not contemplating something as long and drawn out and as politically charged as a pandemic. I, I think it would be important for us as a board to it, acknowledge that there is a, an opportunity for us to review our policy related to emergency management. I think in, in one of our codes, it says that the emergency manager reports and serves at the will of the board. And in another section, it says that they um, report to the county manager. So there's even some conflicting um, within, our own, within our own language and different parts of our code. We've, we've there's just cleanup that needs to be had. And I know it is a very, um, it's a hot button topic and it's not an easy top discussion to have right now, given the nature of everything that's going on. And I'm not suggesting that in the middle of this um, 
flashpoint that we just, that we dig in right now, but I think we need to at least set a time that we are willing to tackle that topic because it it hasn't been looked at or addressed in this climate. And um, so I would just throw that out there as as a possibility if the board would entertain the idea of looking at that at some point in the future. And those are the crickets I expected. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what, what I would like um, and would support absolutely to Commissioner Lockhart's point, if there is some poor part of the code um, that Commissioner Lockhart is referring to, if, if I could ask Commissioner Lockhart to share that with the county attorney's office to understand what those are and what that means and if we need to take appropriate corrective measures or something needs to be updated or clarified, I think we should do that, absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate that and, and, I, and I think that that's, you know, certainly at the minimum, I hope we can do that, but the question will be which, which one is the right one. I don't, I don't know, I'll leave that to the attorney to determine, but um, I'm looking at him like it's Hollywood Squares. <laughs> But I, I just, I, I just know that with yes, we are a charter county, and yes, other counties and municipalities handle this differently. But we, as a board, have not discussed how we really want the situation to be handled. From for, and maybe this is for for another board. Maybe this is a discussion that happens after November. You know, I, I don't know. But I think that it hasn't certainly been openly discussed and talked about in this new world that we're living in and all of the different um, potential positives and pitfalls of how we have it um, arranged right now. And, and you know, we may decide that we love it the way it is and we decide not to change it, but I just think that the community deserves to hear us talk through the policy that we have in place because certainly it has caused a lot of heartburn and anxiety for a lot of people, especially our staff, um, quite honestly. And so um, I'll, I've, I've brought it up. It can be the elephant in the room for as long as people want it to be there, but I felt like it needed to be at least brought to the table. Well, again, I, I would absolutely support the county attorney looking at those conflicts that Commissioner Lockhart looked at. Uh, I believe we should wait until um, this emergency orders are, have come and passed. I don't know that we want to switch horses halfway through the race. Uh, I don't think that's wise nor productive, um, regardless of, of what's happening. Um, so that would be my two cents worth. Commissioner Kerry, then Mr. Applegate. Well, I recall back in the early days of um, you and Commissioner Lockhart being elected to office, we had a conversation about going through all of our administrative policies and county manager policies. And now y'all have been here almost two years and we haven't started that process yet. I don't think start it until after November when you have your new board seated. Um, but I do think that that needs to happen. And I think it's a good educational process for board members, even board members that have been there for a while to have refreshers on our policies and, and procedures and those type of things because, um, you know, we forget. And, and many of our policies have been in place since we became a charter county or before. And unless something happens like this, you don't really ever go back and look at them again as long as it's all working pretty well. But I think it would be a good um, practice to go through that process that was requested a couple of years ago. Or, uh, Mr. Applegate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To follow up on uh, both their comments, uh, actually our code of ordinances for emergency management was adopted and I don't have a code book in front of me right now, but maybe four or five years ago. And it was the board's decision back then that it's really not a conflict, I guess you can is uh, who appoints and who does that person who's appointed report to. Um, but I would certainly agree that um, a 
board can certainly look at these issues at any time it chooses, um, even during a pandemic, but rather not deal with that during a pandemic. Um, but clearly when this passes, um, it certainly can be looked at. This, our ordinance mirrors the statute, um, uh, the Florida statutes almost to the letter in, in most areas. So it's, you know, um, but it was only, it was adopted at a public hearing. Uh, the public had a right to have input uh, into the, the adoption process. So I don't want anyone thinking that this was something that was just ran through and without a public hearing. This was done transparently and appropriately under Florida law. Absolutely, and and please let me clarify. No one probably during that transparent process envisioned this. Oh, absolutely. So, right. I, so I'm asking for us to look at it in this new world that we're in. No one can ever predict everything that could possibly come up, and so to be to be able to pivot and be nimble if we need to be. I, that's and I certainly don't want to talk. I'm not suggesting we make modifications in the middle of a flashpoint. I'm suggesting that we at least acknowledge that it needs to be looked at and set a, a time frame for when we might want to address it. That's agreed. Hopefully that meteor isn't coming that way. So yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree. We're we're just happy to look at it. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Lockhart. Uh District One, Commissioner Delari. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have just a couple of quick items. At the uh, Metroplan Orlando, uh, we have an MPO grant that we received. It's a partnership between UCF, uh, FDOT, as well as Metroplan. Uh, the grant's for about $300,000. $300, it's for crash predictability and uh, expedited de uh, detention, no, detection grant. And what it is, it's a grant that we're looking that we're actually received where we'll be getting funds to try to do depictive uh, type of uh, warning and actually be able to move up our first responders, both uh, law enforcement, uh, fire, paramedics, and relay that to the ERs. And uh, I wanted to thank UCF and FDOT for doing that. Uh, we actually witnessed this on the West Coast. We were at one of our NARC meetings uh, last year. So we were able to put a grant together. We actually get that money. The other grant that we received was the Regional uh, Advanced Mobility Elements, or FRAME. Uh, that's about $10 million, and that's for a project up and down I-4. Uh, so we're looking forward for that as well. I was asked from the uh, Oviedo American Legion post, uh, even though we spoke about it at the last meeting, they wanted me to report back to not just his board, but to also thank Alan Harris for the quick response uh, about trying to get the, and they did, get the American Legion reopened because of uh, they don't serve alcohol or they don't have a restaurant. Uh, they were able to inform the rest of the other American Legion posts around the state and all the other Legion posts were quite impressed on how well they work with the county and uh, they informed them that they have a direct connection to Alan Harris and they wanted to me to basically repeat that uh, words of thank you to Mr. Harris and to this board for acting so fastly. So that's the end of my report. Thank you, Commissioner Delari. And uh, I will do district two and chair report uh, all in one in the interest of saving time. Also, Clint, I would ask that uh, we are going to have Mr. Larry Ross give a, a presentation here in just a few minutes uh, under my chair report. If you could uh, just have him queued up and then we'll call him in. Um, first on the agenda is, as everybody knows, we recently have done an evaluation of the county manager uh, and the county attorney. And um, a, that is something that has been the second year follow up since uh, Commissioner Lockhart and I arrived here. And I appreciate everybody uh, participating in that, as well as Mr. Ross. So I'm going to go through some things real quick and then we'll get Mr. Ross up and he'll give us his presentation of, of that review process. Um, as everybody knows, we've been attending numerous press conferences, um, you know, every week trying to help staff roll out things, get the message out. I appreciate everybody's support in that. 
the July 4th Geneva Parade, of course, did not happen this year, but there was a small gathering of the folks in my district in the Geneva area, including David Smith, Representative David Smith. Uh, basically, it was done on Facebook, just a small gathering, National Anthem and the Pledge, and a memorial to Rocky Harrelson, a uh, picture of the community who unfortunately we lost last year. Uh, the folks from Spruce Creek Flying, uh, the Gaggle Group um, flew over in, in his memory uh, earlier in the day as uh, veterans and volunteers. Certainly an amazing group, and, and those that have attended the Geneva Parade yearly always look forward to that flyover that uh, Rocky was always a uh, participant and, and part of. So somebody dearly and, and certainly missed uh, not only in the district of Geneva, but throughout our whole county. So uh, we, we, we certainly miss those kind of people. Of course, COVID uh, is an everyday situation. It's, if it's not a press conference or a Zoom conference with our fellow or sister counties, uh, uh, health officials, so on and so forth, um, also with company and small business leaders. Um, outside of that, um, policies and procedures. We talked a little bit about that earlier today. Um, we ask uh, the county manager to put together um, shortly after Commissioner Lockhart and I were elected, we had asked for some consideration to put together some uh, board code of conduct, policies, procedures, those types of things. Um, Ms. Gay has been working on that as, as now ready to send that out to all the commissioners. So what I would ask that my fellow commissioners do is uh, when Ms. Guillet sends those out to you all, if you would be kind enough to review those, weigh in, make your comments, send back to Ms. Guillet. Uh, if you have inquiries to Ms. Guillet or the county attorney or whoever, uh, I would suggest you do that. And then let's uh, try to bring those back and, and decide whether that's something we can adopt. Some of it's going to have to go into the code, of course, uh, but I think that's something that it was brought up earlier today by Commissioner Lockhart, uh, and that's something I think would serve not only this board, but future boards uh, for good guidance and structure on, on how to get things on the agenda, code of conduct, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I would just ask that uh, everybody look at those with an open mind and, and an honest heart and respond back with whatever comments and let's have some candid dialogue on how we move forward with that. So with that said, I appreciate it very much. And uh, Mr. Larry Ross, we welcome you here today to give us uh, your presentation on our evaluation of our county attorney and our county manager. So welcome, sir. And thank you, commissioners. Good afternoon to everyone. I know it's been a very long day for you. so. Uh, I'll get right to the point. Um, for those who may be watching in and don't know, I'm Dr. Larry Ross, uh, Professor Emeritus at Florida Southern College in Lakeland and the president of FMB Associates that does uh, professional uh, services for in the area of strategic planning, uh, employee engagement, and a special type of performance review um, outside of the ordinary one-to-one um, -one relationship of a direct supervisor and a subordinate, uh, where we have a typically a senior level administrator who re reports to a board. Uh, and so uh, that's what we're reporting out on today. This is the uh, if, next slide, please. Uh, this is the second year uh, for this. This is a methodology that's been in use now for about 18 years. Uh, with many of my clients, uh, mostly in the Florida, in uh, many in government, but also in nonprofits and for profits. Uh, we use a, a same format typically, which involves a combination of objective scores and subjective comments, and the value comes in the subjective comments. We, um, in this case, uh, agreed on seven performance, dimen seven performance dimensions for both parties, uh, both uh, the county manager and the county attorney different dimensions, but seven. And we had the same seven as last year. And we had the same five commissioners. 
So everyone has experience. So we have um, pretty reliable, I think, uh, valid results as a result. Uh, we, uh, the process, just as a reminder, starts with a conversation with the two parties being reviewed uh, to see if there's any concerns or uh, revisions necessary. Then they prepare a personal summary, which essentially is a self-evaluation shared with the commissioners. Uh, everyone has a chance to review that material uh, prior to completing their evaluation. And then I conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews with each commissioner. Uh, followed by a summarization and a report, which I uh, also meet one-on-one -on -one with each of the uh, parties being reviewed and cover any concerns or clarifications. So we are at that step F uh, where we're presenting the summary report. And next slide, I'm going to start with the uh, county attorney, if that's quite all right. Uh, just as a kind of a quick highlight of what we can uh, um, deduct, if you will, from um, Bryant's performance review. There are seven dimensions. Uh, the average score across all five commissioners in all seven dimensions exceeds 4.4. The highest is a 4.72, and this is on a one to five scale, where five me, uh, means exceeds, expect, exceeds expectations, and four meets expectations. So you can see in uh, summing all of his scores with a 4.56 that the county attorney exceeds overall and in individual dimensions exceeds the expectations of the five commissioners. Now within those seven dimensions and five commissioners, there are 35 individual scores. Uh, 14 of those scores were a five this year, about 40%. 10 of the scores were 4.5 or greater. So uh, on the exceeds expectation scale, um, we can conclude therefore that about 79% you know, of all of the possible ratings for the county attorney exceeded the expectations of the commissioners. Uh, there were eight ratings of 4.0, meaning meets expectations and only three ratings of 3.67, which is uh, slightly above average to uh, somewhat below meets expectations. Um, uh, overall, a uh, very positive uh, uh, complimentary evaluation of the county attorney's performance. There were also, uh, uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, comparisons, um, the one category titled ca uh, interaction with county manager, uh, we saw a 19% improvement uh, in the attorney's uh, efforts uh, in that interaction. So uh, even though they're not, uh, not necessarily supposed to agree on everything or be best buddies, uh, because they are the two employees of the commission, it's important that they collaborate and um, uh, work well together. And so uh, excellent, excellent job there. Uh, of the remaining six dimensions, a four showed between a two and 8% improvement and only two technical competency slightly down and professional relationships um, down 1% uh, average score over last year. All in all, very good, uh, very good. Uh, just a brief uh, recap of the qualitative comments. Um, there were fewer this year for the county attorney. Only 43 comments were recorded uh, uh, as compared to 57 last year. Uh, this is not unusual when you have a, a performance evaluation with uh, very high scores exceeding expectations. There's usually not much room for improvement, uh, so you don't see as many uh, comments in those areas. Uh, the vast majority of the 43 scores, 34 of the 43 comments, um, about 79%, were in fact complementary of uh, Bryant's current or past year uh, performance. There were um, a handful of comments uh, that were basically evenly distributed across the, for um, leveraging existing strengths or in one or two cases uh, doing things uh, differently in the coming year. Uh, again, the overall performance of 4.56 uh, is a meets expectations uh, score, um, uh, well, well above the uh, normal range. If I may go to the next person, then we'll save comments for the end in the interest of time. Next slide. 
Uh, the county manager scores, uh, again, uh, seven dimensions, different dimensions in this uh, uh, case. The average scores for six out of the seven dimensions were greater than 4.0. Um, just a comment, when you're reading uh, the report that was provided to you, uh, please be sure you have the, the last version with the revised scores. There was a mistake on my part in getting all of the scores corrected and out to you on a timely basis, but you should have had it uh, yesterday, hopefully. So six of seven dimensions uh, meets expectations, um, and the only dimension uh, that was below 4.0 was supervision and leadership at 3.65, which means uh, above average to somewhat below meets expectations. Uh, the county manager's highest score was in fiscal management with a 4.65, exceeding expectations, and many of the comments uh, made note of the fact that in last year's um, retreat, there was a request a consensus from the board that we move up the budgeting cycle uh, by three months. And uh, Nicole was very successful at doing that. And uh, it was very, turned out to be very timely uh, given that the uh, pandemic happened to get started just about the time uh, the budget cycle was completed, which puts you well ahead of the game uh, when compared to other jurisdictions and even in your past uh, uh, fiscal uh, performance. Uh, Nicole's uh, overall job performance of 4.09 uh, meets expectations on a 4.0 um, scale, uh, four, one to five point scale. Uh, her individual ratings, uh, five, excuse me, 10 of her individual ratings were a five for about 30%. Five were 4.5 or greater. So approximately 43% of the board's rate uh, review of Nicole's performance exceeded expectations. And that was in fact a dramatic improvement uh, over the first year's uh, review. Uh, 13 of the 35 ratings uh, were in the 3.5 to 4.0 range, uh, suggesting that again, above average to somewhat meets the commissioner's expectations. And Nicole had seven ratings uh, between 2.75 and 3.2, indicating average performance. About 20% of her scores were in that area. However, uh, when you look at scores year over year, uh, she had a 34% improvement in her score for fiscal management, which is just you know, a pretty remarkable uh, jump. She had a 27% improvement in communications. Again, uh, truly uh, a significant improvement. Uh, and then uh, between 3.7 and about 20% improvement for the remaining five uh, areas of performance. So across the board uh, improvement, uh, keeping in mind that this uh, performance review uh, process is essentially an exercise in communicating expectations. I'd say that uh, the first year was somewhat successful and the second year uh, very successful. In terms of uh, the subjective comments, uh, she had uh, she received 61 uh, comments, again, with some scores below exceeding expectations. There tends to be more comments for how to improve or, or uh, what to do more of. Uh, 26 of the 61 comments uh, not quite half were complimentary, um, and 12 were uh, changed, uh, 12 of the comments were directed at specific changes in behavior. I'll leave it to each of you to read the summary report. Uh, again, Nicole and I have gone over uh, all of those. Her overall performance of 4.09 uh, somewhat uh, meets, maybe slightly ex exceeds expectation, but uh, certainly meets expectations and is up, as I said, dramatically uh, from last year uh, when she received a, a slightly above average overall score. A uh, couple of recommendations before we go to comments. Uh, I hope, uh, whether it's with me or someone else, uh, that you'll continue the process. Uh, I think there was a benefit to the county, uh, benefit to the commission, and benefit to each of the two individuals in terms of uh, clarifying expectations and getting specific feedback on uh, what those expectations uh, truly are. Um, and I also, uh, knowing that you have a big election coming up in November, 
uh, would suggest that uh, you uh, uh, build in some sort of orientation for any newly uh, seated, newly elected uh, commissioners uh, that gives them a preview of this process, including maybe past year's results, uh, so that they know come you know the anniversary uh, when they're going to be expected to participate in the process, uh, just what exactly it, it involves. They can begin to communicate expectations and monitor performance prior to the you know weeks before the uh, actual evaluation process. And with that, uh, next slide, I'll, I'll uh, invite you to make comments uh, to either the parties or certainly ask questions of me or uh, Nicole or Brian. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Um, if staff would be so kind to allow the screen to repopulate for me, thank you. Nope. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, inquiries of Dr. Ross or comments? Commissioner Kerry? Well, I would just like to say, I think that this has been an excellent process for us to go through. Um, and I certainly hope that the board will continue to do this. I, only, I think it's only fair that people get uh, evaluation. I don't think it should have anything to do with be tied to compensation. I think it should be standalone. And, um, and then we would use that tool at a later time to look at the compensation of the two top leaders of our organization. I also think that the um, process that we went through for, you know, retreats and setting expectations and setting goals and objectives is also helpful. But again, they change uh, on a regular basis. And what's important today, pre-COVID may not be after COVID. So I think that they're, um, the continuation of that process um, is, really important to the overall strength of the organization and certainly hope that the board will continue to do that. And I think that Dr. Ross has done an excellent job. Um, I think his uh, approach and his demeanor and just, you know, really understanding it and having done this for so many years for governments. Uh, I know when we, before we hired him, we got a proposal from UCF and they had never really done it. So I think we had the right choice by going with Dr. Ross. And, um, and I think he's going to continue to work. So I would encourage you to continue to um, utilize his services because I think it's really been important for not only our team, but also for the two top spots, the county manager and the county attorney to understand what our expectations are and what they're going to be judged on. So um, appreciate the fact that everybody agreed to start down this process uh, last year when I was still the chairman. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Kerry. Commissioner Delari, your hands raised. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank Dr. Ross for his uh, work with this. Uh, I think it was well done, not just last year, but this year. And uh, I think you are the right choice. And I also think you're the right choice to move forward. Uh, I think it's important that we all have goals and objectives. Uh, I'd like to see us do that again. I thought it was very beneficial for us to do that uh, off-site the way we did it with our, our staff and our county manager and county attorney. So I would like to uh, re-engage and continue to engage with Dr. Ross as we move forward, because it's important that everyone gets reviewed on a timely basis. And I think your uh, process is very beneficial to us all, as well as the citizens. So I wanna encourage us to continue working with Dr. Ross uh, next year, whoever the county commission board is made up of last next year. So I'd like to get that set up for next year as well now. Yep, good point, Commissioner Delari, and thank you. Mr. Lockhart? I sound like a broken record here. Uh, I, I agree with Commissioner Delari. Mr. Lockhart, hold up, hold up one second. There's a lot of like echo, not sure. Yeah, have Mr. Ross and Commissioner Delari, there you go, mute their mics. Yeah, try, yeah, try that. Okay, Commissioner Lockhart, give it a go. I'm going to sound like a broken record, or maybe. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, I agree with Commissioner Delari that I'd like to go ahead and get us set up uh, for next year so that the ball is in motion because um, consistency is so key in any type of process like this. And um, Dr. Ross has done a great job and, and certainly given us a, a great um, a format and a 
a roadmap to follow, which is um, certainly not an easy thing to do when you've got so many different um, personalities and perspectives involved. And um, so I give you tremendous credit for developing really a, a niche, I think, in dealing with people like us. <laughs> we're, we're, we could be a handful, I know. Um, can you, though, Dr. Ross, would you be willing to help clarify something for me as a part of the process? Because I agree with Commissioner Carey um, that we need to continue to work on developing uh, goals and objectives as a board in that strategic planning process and, and that that should always be happening. But how much of our of, of this overall review and evaluation process should be measured on those goals and objectives in the strategic planning process and the seven dimensions? I'm, I want to make sure that I'm clear on, on how those work together. Oh, uh, thanks for the question. More so for the county manager than the county attorney, obviously, because the retreat is, uh, is designed to create goals and expectations around county operations under the leadership of the county manager. So I would say much more so for the manager than for the attorney. Uh, secondly, I think in the current seven dimensions that we're using for Seminole County, uh, two in particular uh, are tied, two dimensions in particular are tied to the retreat, which would be uh, fiscal management, because the budget should reflect those priorities that you all set. And secondly, uh, supervision, uh, excuse me, uh, secondly, uh, policy and planning, because the strategic plan is sort of the ultimate planning exercise, um, you know, in terms of setting long term Vision. So I would I would suggest that uh, they're not separate. Uh, I mean, the, the review should reflect performance by the county manager in those two areas specifically related to the retreat. Um, if for some reason, and and Nicole and I talked about this in our one on one, um, it is either her desire or the commissioner's desire to create a new dimension performance dimension, an eighth dimension or, or change one of the, that deals specifically with performance against strategic plan, happy to do that. But I, I do think it, it probably is, again, the county manager has a complex job over 365 days of the year. And you want to be careful not to single out, you don't want the performance review to drill down too tightly into just one area of performance. So just caution there. All right. Well, um, uh, Dr. Ross, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I will echo many of the sentiments of my fellow commissioners. I actually would like to carry it one step further and see that the board actually consider putting it into our policies and procedures um, that an annual review be done. Uh, of these two individuals on an annual basis. There currently is nothing really there that speaks to that. Um, there, there is some contractual agreements that originally existed that uh, probably eventually ought to be looked at um, by this board. Uh, and I think that's something we ought to look at moving forward for the future boards uh, of having something in place uh, to do that. And so, uh, that may be helpful, um, I think, for, for new board members as well as, you know, future boards when those individuals come on and they understand, like Dr. Ross indicated, you know, briefing those new commissioners as they come in to understand what maybe last year's results and grades were, what the expectation and timeline is for them to evaluate um, would probably be very helpful for those new commissioners. So any other inquiries, Commissioner Carey? Well, a couple of things. I, I mean, I think that having some, at least one line item in there to say, how are you doing compared to the strategic plan? Because if you're going to continue to update the strategic plan, that needs to be one of the measurable goals that we're, you know, that we're measuring against. 
some things in the plan take longer, obviously, to do than others. Um, and as far as a policy, um, you know, I'm not sure how you um, enforce what happens by the county commission. Um, you know, we had a policy that said we would review annually and, and the chairman would pass out the evaluations. And I can tell you that, you know, there were times nobody returned them when Commissioner Haram was the chairman there, you know, he got pushed back, nobody returned them, one person would return them. And then, you know, so what was the point of going through the exercise? That's why I think engaging Dr. Ross to do this, where it became, it's a team effort to do the strategic planning, but it's also, you know, an expectation and so I don't know if that needs to go in the admin code in order to cause that to happen or in the policies, because if the county commissioners decide to, you know, at the chairman, then, I mean, there really is no, nothing that the chairman can do about that other than try to appeal to them that it's really helps the organization if everybody participates. It really is unfair when that doesn't happen because there, you know, there were several years that they went without a review just because the county commissioners wouldn't fill out the paperwork for whatever reason, um, you know. And so I'd like to see you at least put it in somewhere, either in code or policy, where it has to happen. Right. It's not yeah. just a question. Um, and I think updating the strategic plan, at least, you know, we, we did it a couple of times. We went through this process last year because we were just starting to set the, the goals and objectives, but, uh, and you may want to do it more frequently than once a year until you get it down pat. Um, and I think, you know, you know, you're going to have at least one change on the board. So, I mean, I think that doing things after the new board is seated in November would be the right time. Um, but I also think that having an orientation similar to what the uh, Citizens Academy goes through, where you go to all the different departments and you actually look and see and touch and feel how they do it. You know, some commissioners take that initiative on their own, like Commissioner Lockhart did, and then other commissioners don't ever go out into the departments. They have no idea, you know, of how operations go and what have you. And I know that years ago, when I went through the Citizens Academy, that was one of the things that we did. You know, I was one of the inaugural members of the Citizens Academy, and we went to all the different departments, and, you know, you went to the fire department, you fell, held the fire hose, and you, you know, you really got some idea of what was a requirement for the employees. And so I think having a very in-depth uh, orientation set up and ready to go, this is how we're going to do it um, for the new commissioners, I think would be very helpful for them because it isn't like they get, you know, six months of training. They get, you know, seated on November 16th and on December, the second Tuesday in December, they're going to have a county commission meeting and have to vote and make decisions. And so I think in that time frame and i know you got holidays in there and that kind of stuff but i really think that you know it needs to be a very uh, intense if you will orientation for for the board members so i think that's a great idea agreed okay anything else on this matter seeing none well dr ross again we thank you very much uh for your uh, participation assistance in this uh, i found it I think everybody you've heard found it very, very uh, valuable to us, and uh, we wish you well and, and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Uh, with that, um, Clint, do we have anyone on the line for the public who wishes to address the commission on any future item um, or for any other purpose? Mr. Chairman, while he's looking at that, I just want to confirm, you said you're going to circulate the policies um, that, that have been drafted by Ms. Guillet to all of our offices, is that correct? Yes, I'll make sure that it gets sent out so everybody could review that and give feedback back to the, the county manager on what we may or may not like. Okay, thanks. Thank yep. you. Uh, no, sir, are there are no hands raised. No hands raised. Is there any additional business? Uh, on behalf of any of the commissioners at this juncture, if there are none, we'll hereby stand in recess. Thank you all. Be safe.